I want to ask you, feel free to answer on a volunteer basis, what do you expect from this workshop? Yeah. Anyone? Um, yes? I think I'm loud enough. <laughs> so, um, I think what I'm hoping to get from this is strategies uh, of taking and teaching a curriculum that already exists to Muslim children through a Muslim framework and mindset. So we, I think what I've seen is a lot of times we have curriculum that is already out there and we take that and we try to teach it to our children and try to uh, give a Muslim or Islamic framework to that uh, without really knowing how to go about doing it. And I think strategies of implementing a Muslim curricular framework into whatever already exists is the goal that I'm hoping to accomplish. I sense and I feel, and there's a gut feeling that a lot of them are in line with the Islamic practices of teaching and education. Um, but I would like to get a lot of that reaffirmed by um, what are the best practices through the Sunnah and through the Islamic teachings. Because um, a lot of it seems very intuitive, and a lot of the conversations today seem like they're very much in line with that.
to the uh, <coughs> see the big picture. Yeah. Usually, most parents, when they're homeschooling or teachers, when they're teaching, they they want to go into the details uh, without necessarily seeing the big picture. So it's like you know when you want to uh, understand the symptoms of an illness. Then you go to the doctor, the doctor will give you a prescription or pill, but the doctor may not give you the big picture of what's happening in the body unless you ask. And when you ask, the doctor may give you some insight. And even then, you won't know as a lay person how the human body is working, acting, reacting. And you know, the, the, in the grand scheme of things, okay, what is the analysis uh, that needs to be there for the diagnosis and the prognosis and so on. So I want to take a step back, or perhaps two or three steps back, to investigate perhaps the, uh, the philosophy of what is a Muslim education, right? And we distinguish first and foremost between what is Muslim and what is Islamic. What is Muslim is a Muslim's contribution to a field independent of uh, an Islamic agenda. And an Islamic understanding will be what is based on uh, the Quran and Sunnah and what is Wahi based. Yeah. So the Islamic word, the word Islamic, uh, would have to include a Wahi-based discussion, a theory that comes out from Wahi-based content. And a Muslim's contribution may or may not be based on Wahi-based knowledge. So you do have to make the distinction there. So there are many uh, educationists who are Muslim, but they may not have necessary Islamic paradigm or Islamic philosophy or theory behind what they do. Okay. So first and foremost, uh, in this session, the sessions may run much um, later than advertised. It won't be that the time will be divided equally in all four sessions. We don't do that. The, the, the uh, skeleton I gave you was for you, not for me. Okay. So if it runs more than uh, one hour each or 45 minutes each, just um, humor me. Because uh, if we get into the flow of the discussion, that's more valuable to you than it is to uh, continue talking without some kind of interaction. So if there are questions in between, feel free to ask. If there are comments or other ideas or suggestions, feel free to participate, hopefully, in this discussion. The first thing I want to address today is epistemology. Epistemology, as uh, all of you know, is uh, how do we know what are the sources of knowledge? How do we know and what are the sources of knowledge whereby we can say we know through this means or these tools or this avenues? So epistemology is a huge field in academia and the science of epistemology will go along with whatever it is your philosophy. Um, so in Islam we have an epistemology. Muslim scholars, they dealt with this issue from the very, very beginning. What are our sources of knowledge? Uh, you're talking about the pre-Dark Ages, right? you're talking about the 7th, 8th century. When you <coughs> perhaps was non-existent. They didn't even know anything. Never mind. Discuss epistemology. Excuse the pun, but anyway. Muslim scholars understood that in order for us to uh, engage in academia and the field of knowledge, we need to know how we learn and what are the sources of our knowledge. And they are able to articulate this in a, in a very ingenious way. So we see that these are the tools of learning, as mentioned in this diagram. So, first and foremost, you have the five senses. You see the five senses there? 
you are hearing and you are seeing and you are touching, you are smelling and you are tasting. So the five senses are definitely a tools of knowing and the tools of, uh, you know, knowledge that we all acquire through these five senses. And the knowledge we acquire from these five senses is real, although it's based on experience, but definitely it's real. It's not something that is what, uh, relative. Mm. What do you think? The knowledge that we gain from five senses is real, absolute, is relative. Is sugar sweet to everybody? When you taste and you get a sensation of sweetness, and then that sweetness uh, is now processed by your mind and say this, I, I know that sugar is sweet. So how do you know sugar is sweet? Because you've tasted it. Is that right? So you see the color red. Now your seeing tells you that this is red with a bit of blue in it. So your mind tells you, so is that knowledge concrete? Is that absolute? Is it relative? Is it relative? Yeah. How so? Depends on the person's perception. Yeah, well, so you're saying that someone may perceive this red to be another color? Mm -hmm. They may feel it differently as well. They will? Yeah? yeah. Everybody agree? I'm asking you this. I'm not going to issue a fatwa against anybody for saying what I actually think or believe in. I'm, I'm fine with that. It is very open. So feel free to express your views, inshallah. When you hear a sound, and that sound is of a bell, is that the knowledge that this sound is the sound of a bell, is that real? Or is that something else? Is it real? It's real. Okay. We'll let go of that and we'll discuss it inshallah more. The basic question is what is knowing and what is knowledge? So you have two issues. One is the infinitive to know. Right? In grammar you have this infinitive. To know is, is infinite. And the other is knowledge. So now when you have knowledge, is it in one moment that you acquire the knowledge or is it through a process that you keep on learning? These are discussions that are very integral to Islamic learning. And the early Muslim scholars, they dwelled into these uh, ideas and questions because they wanted to make sense of you know, knowledge as it came from the Prophet as it came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala these are questions they raise and let's define knowledge first, what is knowledge? is it a perception, is it an idea is it a, an image in your mind that is decoded uh, or is it an experience what is knowledge? so I'm going to leave you with these questions you know, I want to answer them because I don't know <laughs> right? We're still learning. We have some knowledge from the Quran Sunnah which tells us this is knowledge. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think we should really engage in these types of discussions. So the five senses uh, forms the basis of your empirical knowledge. So when you want to say empiricism, empiricism is about collecting data from your five senses that you're going to observe. So you have a scientific approach or you have a hypothesis and you're going to conduct an experiment and the experiment will be through your seeing, through your hearing, uh, through your touching and tasting and all of that. So your five senses play an immense role in how you eventually deduce and conclude which leads us to the second which is the mind and the intellect. <coughs> the issue of the mind and intellect is huge. Yeah, so we do so many things through the mind, through the intellect, and our ability to rationalize. And we have now cognitive ideas, and we have ideas of the memory in the mind, and we have ideas of perception, and we have ideas of 
deduction and induction and we have the ideas of intuition. We just have so many processes that we use through the mind and we, we add and we subtract and we divide and we multiply. That's all through the mind. So the mind allows you to process and allows you to come to a decision where you say we have knowledge through the mind. So the mind is a tool by which we know. Now the knowledge we gain from the mind, now that's subject to a much larger debate than the knowledge we acquire from the five senses. The knowledge we acquire from the five senses, there's not much debate, there is a debate, no doubt. But the knowledge we acquire from our mind and intellect is totally, absolutely relative. Right. It's never going to be concrete unless it is factual. Now who decides whether this is a fact or not? Who decides one plus one equals two? It's a given, right? But who's, who decides it's a given? No? So the mathematicians here. The Bertrand Russell spent 200 pages trying to prove 1 plus 1 equals 2. He tried to prove it. In 200 pages of writing, 1 plus 1 equals 2, logically and mathematically, because of the, the, these... Uh, obviously, now, you're going to presuppose certain maxims. Okay? The maxims are subjective. When you presuppose something, that I, I, I suppose 1 is a number, and 1 plus 2, 1 plus 1 equals 2, I'm supposing that, based on my su supposition, uh, I'm going to say this is factual knowledge, and so on. Right. So now, the universe works according to Newtonian uh, laws of physics and the mechanical approach to understanding science, and that's functional. But then came Einstein and said, no, there's a, something called the theory of relativity, uh, which doesn't necessarily, um, you know, give too much credence to the mechanical universe. But without the mechanical universe, you can't function. Right? In order for you to function, you need uh, values to be objectified through subjectivity. You need to say this is a yard. You need to say this is a mile. Uh, or you need to say this is a kilometer or this is a centimeter, whichever. Uh, you know, index a user, whichever convention you use, you're going to say, I'm going to assume that this is real. When you assume this is real, then you can function. So you have a functional knowledge, and you have knowledge which is outside of the function, where you are going to discuss other theories and say, this knowledge now of the function is relative to the system that uses this function. So there was when you, when you discuss the knowledge gained through the mind, then you're opening a whole u universe of knowledge. And that is where we, unfortunately, as human beings, suffer. Because we can't make up our minds what is real and what is not real, what is absolute and what is relative. So when you, when you discuss the sources of knowledge, and you say the first source of knowledge in your five senses, we can almost universally agree to that, okay? Except for the few people who are stubborn and they are sophists and they really don't believe that there's anything called real pain. Um, the Muslims encountered this philosophy through the Greeks and there was a group of Greek philosophers who said that pay, even pain is relative and it's not objective, meaning the five senses don't give you enough credence to say you have concrete knowledge. So anyway, the ulama said, let's throw him into the fire and ask him whether the fire is real or not. Right? As a pun. Yeah. <laughs> not as fun, but as a pun. He said, yeah, take this and see whether it's real. Now, in the mind, we disagree so much, and the mind will yield many conclusive facts, which is wonderful. At the same time, the mind is open to interpretation. Interpretation then is subjective, right? Interpretation is not absolute, as you will see perhaps later on in the theories of education that we have. 
You have so many theories of education, philosophies of education. One says this, and the other says this. Now, how do you know which one is real, which one is true, which one is false, and which one is uh, the most versatile, etc.? It depends on your point of reference. Which philosophy is going to be best suited for you, for your child, and for your school? That's why this discussion is of great importance to us as to, you know, what is the nature of knowledge that we receive or perceive through the mind, through the internet? You know? So this is one place where I think the Muslim scholars really, very early on in the 8th century, 9th century, they sat down and they discussed, and they argued, and they bickered, and they called each other names, you know, which is what we do as human beings. Right? You must remove the fallacy that when Muslims discuss, they're angels. They're not angels when they discuss, they're human beings. And they shout at each other, and they call each other names, and they do everything. And that every human race does, basically. They're part of the human race, like we're Muslims, yeah. On that note, the angels also argue. The Quran tells us the angels argue. And they debate. Yeah, they, they have a sense of argumentation. They love. Uh, there's a group of angels. The only thing they do is they argue. Fima yaktasimu al-malul ala yaktasimu. For those of you who know Arabic, yaktasimu means what? To debate. It means argue. So you have a whole group of angels out there, you know, somewhere in the heavens, who sit down and they debate the amr of Allah. They debate the command of Allah. How should this command be executed as it comes down in time and space? And that uh, now their proposal is then given to a lower ranking angels who govern, uh, who execute the affair and the Allah and so on. So even angels have this great ability to debate. So we, we're, we're not averse to debating. And we should never be averse to debating. At the same time, uh, in uh, theories that are not wahi based, okay, we should not make or jump to a conclusion that this is the absolute truth because there's no such thing as an absolute truth when it comes to non-wahi based issues. Right? Those issues remain subject to discussion, subject to interpretation, and they may be utilitarian at one point and then as you know the utility wears away or the utility is subjective to a certain environment or a certain time and then you move on and you come up with new ideas and new theories to understand how your child or children should be educated. So, you know, the way you're going to educate somebody in Nigeria definitely is not the way you're going to educate the same type of person in Indonesia. And the way you're going to educate that one in Indonesia is nowhere near how you're going to educate that one in California here. Right? I mean, this is the, the, the circumstances change, the environment changes, the ideas changes, the idiosyncrasies change, everything changes, so you have to accommodate for that change and say, how are you going to impart knowledge now? Obviously, there are certain skill sets and certain sciences or disciplines that are universal, and that's how you develop uh, your sense of uh, how you're going to educate uh, people. So the mind. The mind is unique. The philosophers in Islam, they, who were primarily, they weren't really Sunni as such, but they're great philosophers. The people like Al Farabi, Kindi, and Ibn Sina. Okay? They have this huge discussion on the human mind. And they say the most perfect mind is the mind of a prophet. Okay? So they, they go much further than uh, what others do. But they say that the standard mind is the mind of a Nabi, of a prophet. So this is the intellect, the mind and everything else that we do through the mind. Thirdly, you have, although it's written wahi, but it's more of wahi-based knowledge. Okay? It's not wahi per se, because wahi only came to the Prophet After the Prophet we don't have access to knowledge of wahi. We have what is wahi-based, based in wahi, meaning what the Sahaba reported, as wahi and what the tabi'un reported as wahi and until it came to us. So this is wahi based report. What is a report from the Prophet 
this is the third source of knowledge and that gives us the advantage of the Muslim. We're going to be discussing Wahi, inshallah, in some detail. But I want to bring it to, to the forefront is the Muslim advantage. When a Muslim comes to the table of knowledge, how many sources of knowledge is he acknowledging? Three. And when a non-Muslim comes to the table, how many sources is he or she acknowledging? Two. Two. Because if they acknowledge Wahi, then they might as well just be Muslim. Right? So just by being a Muslim, you have an advantage over others because you have opened yourself to knowing what a Nabi knows. And that's huge. That is so huge. That it gives you this immediate advantage of everybody else in the world that our source of knowledge is not limited to two. We have a third. And that is where the pride of a Muslim should be. Okay. So Wahi-based knowledge is knowledge of a sound report that has been narrated from the Prophet وسلم, either in the Quran, which is recited Wahi, or either in the Sunnah, which is non-recited Wahi. So now, a Muslim, when he or she is going to dwell into the knowledge based on wahi, they'll use the intellect, the mind, and the five senses, not just to procure, but also to execute. And our civilization is based on this. There are so many great examples of how our civilization is based on wahi-based inspirations, and so on. You see the great architecture that Muslims uh, were uh, privy to and what they developed through the architecture and through their calligraphy and through the, you know, the wonderful uh, fountains and ponds that they had in front of their masajid and their homes and all of that. Where do you think that came from? <coughs> Why did we have this great system of fountains and ponds outside the masjid? Wudu. Mm. So is Wudu Wahi based or is it through the internet? <coughs> wudu is Wahi based. Wahi. So the Wahi based knowledge that a, a Muslim needs to make Wudu meant that the engineers had to find a way where you're going to facilitate the performance of Wudu when you go to the Masjid, before you go to the Masjid. And they brought the intellect into it and they have managed to uh, understand the rules of irrigation and plumbing and they managed to give it some ihsan, beauty, right? Through the five senses you get beauty. And beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but uh, they had a lot of beauty, right? You understand what I'm saying? It's mean that the, 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 the system of hygiene, because hygiene is based on what? It's based on? Tahara. And Tahara is, is what he based definitely. Nobody else does Tahara the way we do. Is that true? We won't go into that discussion. Well, you go into that discussion, then you shouldn't be anywhere on the planet. Nobody has hygiene the way we do. But Tahara is what he based, and because we believed in Tahara, we wanted to make sure we facilitated Tahara and hygiene wherever we went in the world and we had, as I said, we had the engineering, we had our plumbing and uh, we had these uh, wonderful ways to, to keep ourselves <coughs> clean and hygiene and pure, not just uh, our bodies and our clothing but also our homes and places of prayer and so on. So we made those buildings magnificent out of Ihsan and Ihsan itself is what he based concept. Would you say so? Yeah, from the Hadith? Inna Allah qadr al-ihsan fi kulli shay. Allah has prescribed ihsan in everything. Excellence in everything. So the Muslims took on this hadith and said, let's make this beautiful, magnificent. And you go and you say, you, you stand in the blue masjid and you say, subhanAllah, uh, why am I in America? <laughs> right? That's the only thing that comes to you. Well, what am I doing? I'm in the wrong part of the world. I'm living in the wrong part. This is spectacular. SubhanAllah. 
And the thing about it, the Turks don't even like the Blue Mosque. <laughs> the Turks like the Suleimani Masjid, you know, for other reasons, which we won't get into. But anyway, so, so this, this Wahi-based inspiration allowed the Muslim to use the mind, to use the intellect, to come up with ideas and solutions for the human race, and then they engineered, engineered and built through the five senses. Right? So this is the advantage of a Muslim. The advantage of a Muslim is that a Muslim has immediate access to wahi-based knowledge, and uh, this is where the discussion of wahi comes in. So what is now the scope of wahi? The scope of wahi <laughs> is immense. In order for us to appreciate the scope of wahi, we must appreciate the five phases of human existence. Is that the right time? Yes. It is? Yeah. Sorry, I didn't want to keep this here. Yeah, so what, what would this do? When we discuss Islam, then we discuss Islam holistically, comprehensively, because our knowledge, our knowledge of man is based on wahi. And the knowledge we gain from wahi is more concrete than the knowledge we gain from the intellect and the mind. Right? Why? Because of the scope of Nabuwa. The scope of a Nabi's knowledge far exceeds the scope of the mind and the intellect. Right? Yeah. A Nabi is able to tell you what's going to happen to you after you die. Is there any intellect or mind in the world that tells you this? No. They can speculate that we won't exist or there's no hereafter or we'll be reincarnated or whatever. You can speculate that there's no concrete knowledge. The concrete knowledge of what's going to happen to you after you die comes from Nabuwa, comes from Prophethood, comes from Wahi which came through the <coughs> Prophet Sallallahu via the Sahaba to us. This is how we know that we are going to be in our graves and we will be questioned and uh, we will live there until the Day of the Judgment. That's how we know. Now, do we know this? Yes. Why? Because that's your khidah. If you say you don't know this, then you're not a Muslim. Your aqidah hinges on the idea that this knowledge is concrete. Aqidah is concrete knowledge, it is certain knowledge. Anything that's an aqidah in Islam is concrete and absolute knowledge. It's not relative or speculative. That's the meaning of aqidah. So when your aqidah is correct, you have already accessed knowledge of the Nabi by saying, I know now that after I die or when I die, I'm going to be going into the barzakh into my grave and this is going to happen and I will be there until the day of judgment now you have an added source of knowledge which others don't likewise a Nabi will tell you through Wahi where you were before you came to this world right we all know that we were in our mother's womb but do we know that we did not enter our Ruh did not enter the mother's womb until the fourth month how do we know this? Through Wahi. The Prophet says so, that the angels come and they carry the Ruh and then they insert the Ruh into the, the fetus at the fourth month or after the fourth month. This is called the process of insolment. And that's how we know that now our Ruh came from somewhere else, another place of existence that gives us our primordial existence and that is where we came from. It came from the world of the soul. The alam of the arwah that is mentioned in the Quran and also mentioned in Hadith. Now, this is aqidah. This is why he based knowledge is concrete. This is aqidah that we were somewhere before we came into our mother's womb. How do you know this? A Nabi told us. How do we know this? What he tells us. Right. So, now, when you consider that a man, a human being's existence, 
precedes his existence in this world, then others will speculate, philosophers will speculate, scientists will speculate, and there will be those who are atheists who will say, we don't need to speculate, we don't believe in anything anyway. But what is the advantage of a Muslim? Now, Muslims, I, mind will be open uh, because of Aqeedah. Okay, let me investigate how we were in the world of the Arwah and the spirits before he came. And is there any other knowledge from the Quran and Sunnah that tells us something more about this space? Uh, this real uh, uh, primordial existence. Then you dwell into the source and you find some more knowledge and then you get more knowledge and so on. What I'm saying is that the Wahi tells you all the phases of human existence which the intellect and the mind doesn't have access to. The intellect and the mind doesn't have access to anything beyond time and space. Is that true? The mind can't perceive anything beyond time. It's not possible. Logically, it's not possible. So now, a Nabi's knowledge extends beyond time into the grave, into the Day of Judgment, into Jannah, and into Jahannam. So the Nabi now knows through Wahi, through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that this is what's going to happen. And a Muslim, by definition, will have access to this knowledge by reading the Qur'an and the Sunnah. So now, as you're going to develop an Islamic ideology or philosophy in your education, you must appreciate that we are, now, we are now going to have to incorporate these five phases of human existence as we develop a curriculum and a philosophy to address these five phases of existence. Now this becomes Islamic. What do you think? Any questions? <coughs> Sorry, what are the five phases of existence? I just told you. Is it you weren't using your mind. I only counted three, I'm sorry. Hmm. The other you can deduce through your mind. Oh, okay. <laughs> the first one is primordial. Is there any that ask questions? No, you can ask as many questions as you want. Marshall. Ishtiyat's one of my favorite students, by the way, so. We get on very well, so I can. I can taunt him any way I want. Welcome. So anyway, what I'm saying is that the first one is the world of the arwah, the spirit. Our primordial existence as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took uh, from us the covenant of Alastu bi Rabbikum, am I not your Lord? And we all said, yes, but uh, that's in the Quran. So this is a primordial, a primordial existence. This comes into play later on in the discussion of evil, good and evil. Everything will be related, as we discussed throughout the day. I'll be there now. The second is your mother's womb. That's the second phase, which the Quran also discusses, right? The embryo and the fetus and so on. And then is this world. And then there's the world of the grave. The barzakh. And then there's the mahshar, uh, which is the day of judgment. And then thereafter there's eternity, jannah, and so on. So those are five uh, broad uh, realms of existence for the, uh, the human being. This is not based on speculation. This is based on why a Muslim must know all of these phases in order to be say, say that he or she is a Muslim. We must believe that's part of our qida and so on. So that why he gives us this scope, uh, and this on the uh, the horizontal plane. Why he also gives us a vertical ontology. The vertical ontology is even more amazing than this one. And the vertical ontology is that we have something called the world of bodies. So we have the world of bodies, which is here, the arsh is seen as a body. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's arsh is seen as a body by Muslim metaphysicists and Muslim, by, by, by Muslim uh, theologians. Underneath the arsh you have the seven, the kursi, and then you have the seven heavens. And you have this heaven, then the uh, universe, the planets, the solar systems, and what have you. 
lovely serve, and right in the bottom. Right. So this is how we So in the world of bodies, we have behind that a world which is called the world of imagination or similitudes. In Arabic, it's called mithal. That is a plane from which you will dream. Okay? You dream from that plane, the world of imagination that exists with you in your mind. It coexists with you. It's not outside of you, it's within you. That's also mentioned in the Quran that you have these symbols, right? Yeah. So when you see something in your dream, your dream will see a symbol. And that symbol comes from somewhere within your mind, and that is called the plane of imagination or the plane of the similitudes and figures and symbols. And then they need to be uh, interpreted in order for you to get to the uh, symbol interpreted through the interpretation of dreams. Anyway, behind that, there's what we call the Alim Arwah, the world of Arwah and spirits where the angels live. Okay, that is outside of you. That's not inside you, that's outside of you. So now, th this is how we see the ontology of uh, the human being, uh, that the human being exists in this plane, the, the plane of bodies, and uh, this is how he goes up or down vertically. So now you have to incorporate this also in your philosophy of education. How are you going to do all that? Right. Yeah. Anyway, so what, what, what I'm saying is that when, when, we, when we discuss Islamic ideology, philosophy is going to be based on a monolithic aqidah. That this is the aqidah of everybody who came to the table of Islamic theology. And Muslims dealt with theology from day one, from the time of Ali when uh, he sent out Abdullah ibn Abbas to fight and debate with the Kharijis. And from there we have this great history of Islamic theology, which has come down to us now. And we discuss all of this in that. So the Muslim advantage, basically, that the Muslims' understanding of reality is far greater than the perception of reality of a non-Muslim. Would that be a fair statement? What do you think? Everybody agree? Anyone disagree? Hopefully not. Again, I'm not going to pass judgment. I'm not here to give you fatwas. I'm just saying this is the way it is. And when you incorporate Wahhi-based knowledge, if you decide not to incorporate Wahhi-based knowledge, you're at a severe disadvantage because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave all the prophets immense knowledge. As you know, so Allah is the one who creates and the creator given knowledge to human beings. It is an immense virtue and an immense fadila and merit and so on. Alright, any questions on this? Before we get to the next slide. Discussions? Yes? Um, <clears throat> on senses, I feel like uh, Maybe this isn't the place for this question, but so it's fine. I don't feel like it's the place, but uh, I feel like, especially maybe in some strains of tasawwuf, there's kind of a suspicion of the senses. Um, I mean, Imam Ghazali's existential crisis, kind of, you know, how can we know? And I think, you know, one could argue that part of the conclusion he came to is that those is the only way to know. That senses are, even senses, I and mean, you have Busiris yet. You know, can I really trust what I see um, and feel and touch? So, is, is, I don't know, there's a yeah. comment you might have on that. So, is there a limit to how much we can trust the senses? Or is there some kind of criteria for what sense is How based? much can we trust? Well, what do you say, though? No, is it? I mean, I. That's my understanding of what Ghazali came to yeah. the conclusion of. Like, then how can you trust his though? I'm, I'm reporting. I, you know, I think no, no, that you the the is a very... I mean, advocate for Ghazali. Come on, you're going. Uh, no, yeah, well, I, uh, frankly, I, I'm not sure. I mean, how, yeah, how's, you know, how the dhok is to me more difficult to define than... It's a higher like, level of experience, number one, okay? Yeah. Imam Ghazali does not deny the functional knowledge that the five senses give you. He never denied that. Mm -hmm. okay? 
He is saying that sometimes you need to go beyond the functional level and try to understand knowledge from a higher plane. And that's what he's calling it towards. That uh, leave your five senses and then move uh, towards a higher plane of learning. That would be the understanding we have from, uh, the, the, you know, to self, right? Yeah. Would that be okay? You show yeah, question? No, no, I was just, just saying, I understand such utterances as uh, like grammatical epistemology, uh, epistemological humility in our tradition. Yes. That's right. Gosh. Anything else? Okay. Uh, when we sleep, uh, we enter the world of dreams and imagination, uh, but do we enter the world of spirits as well? We can, yes. It's theoretically possible. Whether we do or not, I don't know. Definition may be one in a billion. Does the dream change according? Would the dream change if we went to the Orwa? Yeah. yeah, theoretically it would. Oh, oh yeah, definitely. It's a different plane altogether. Yeah. But it's one in a billion if you're lucky. After the Sahaba. The Sahaba, they live there, basically. But we, we don't. We may occasionally visit in our dreams in that plane, but. Uh, that's no longer. It is accessible theoretically. If somebody does go there and comes back and says, I went there, if I'm okay. Just keep it to yourself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, one more question. Yes. Um, with imagination, dreams, and symbols, you can interpret uh, certain uh, information. Hazrat Abu Bakr was known to be able to interpret real life events. Was that the same uh, philosophy? Of the yeah, that, that's because he wasn't interpreting from the. Uh, world of imagination. He was interpreting from the world of spirits. That's, he was one of those who lived there. Yeah. Okay. This session, or well, this part of the session, good and evil. We all know about that in California, right? <laughs> if it feels good, it's good. Right. You're into the, the green factor here. Right. Sunny California. I'm just kidding. We have weed in Chicago too. And it's easily accessible. Alhamdulillah. Good and evil. Wonderful discussion. Discussion we've had since uh, the birth of, uh, you know, the fitan, the trials and tribulations that were created through the theology and so on. We've always uh, valued this discussion, I and mean, it's an important discussion when it comes to education, uh, that in your school or philosophy of education, hopefully you're going to be promoting good, and you're going to be um, prohibiting evil. But then you have to define what is good and what is evil. Uh, is good absolute, and is evil absolute? And it's it came from the Greek philosophers, and Aristotle, and he had the virtue ethics, and so on. And it came down into Islam, and post Sahaba, uh, we had many, many discussions on uh, good and evil. Do you have any ideas? Who says good is absolute? Raise your hand. No one? You do? In the angelic prayer. Yes? I mean, if uh, every context is mapped out, then it's... Uh, no, no, what do you believe? Never mind your analysis. What do you believe is, is good? Is good good because it's good? I feel like we have an absolute sense of metric of it. You do? Yeah. Okay. Very good. Yeah. How does one define good and evil? Yeah. So again, you can bring in your five senses, your mind, your intellect, and then obviously why? Okay. In between, there's something called society. Right. Yeah. There's an added factor here in this discussion. Societal values of, uh, of morals and ethics and behavior, which obviously at best is subjective and it's based on experience and utility and so on. But anyway, so as, as you can see, when you want to discuss fundamentally whether or not good is absolute or good is evil or evil is absolute, then you're going to be learning from your five senses and also from your mind and 
and then obviously through wahi, wahi-based knowledge of ta'yub. But even in wahi-based knowledge, there's a difference of opinion, which is what concerns us. Okay? Society, you know, as I said, uh, it depends, you know, which frame of uh, reference you're coming from, what is your philosophy of government, right? That usually dictates a nation's understanding of good and evil. So if you're in the capitalist mode, then free enterprise is good. And if you're in another mode, then it's not good. That makes sense? Yeah. So now your politics will determine your understanding of good and evil. So that's how society tells you what is good and what is evil. Now, policy will also tell you that we now want, we now want, I'm not talking about our president at the moment, but the previous president had this agenda of saying that we, we want to accommodate everybody in the world so now uh, good and evil is relative to the individual and they made a policy that schools must now open themselves up to understanding the individual likes and dislikes of the student. And that's how they instructed their curriculum developers to write their curriculum where you're engaging the student according to the student's individual like and dislike. And so there was a policy. So your policy is now telling the students and the teachers that this is good or this is evil, meaning there's no absolute good and there's no absolute evil. And this is what society does. Okay? So this is this caption of the society. I don't know what that picture says where the poor cook coordinates with society. Which city is that, by the way? Anyway, if you tell me the city, I'll tell you whether it's good or bad. <laughs> uh, whatever. Yeah. So that society will tell you that this is how you must behave in order for you to get an A on your test. And society will tell you this is how you must score, or this is how you must conduct yourself in your interview, if you want to land the job. And this is how you must, must write your resume uh, so that your resume looks good. So th th we use the word good, right, in a very loose way. Well, well no, it's a functional good, right? It's an absolute. So if you wrote a lie in your resume, is that good? It's good because it gave you the job, but it's not good because it's lying. But how do you justify that in society? So society will say that's industry practice to lie on your resume, which everybody does. Right? But the purists will say this is wrong. Okay. That's why there's no place for the purist anywhere in the world. You might as well hibernate. Right? Do you understand what I'm saying? The, 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 the issue of good and evil is so pertinent to our existence that it controls who we are and what we are. That's why now you have the advantage of Wahi. Now you see the advantage of Wahi? So Wahi should tell you that this is good or this is evil. Should is the operative word there. But even there we have a discussion. It is the beauty of Islam and Islamic scholarship in academia that we were open to discussion. We didn't condemn anybody for raising a question. I have a statement, you know, say, we would have never killed Galileo. Muslims didn't need to kill or execute Galileo. You say, fine, who cares whether the sun goes this way or the earth goes away? Who cares? It doesn't impact your salvation on the channel. Let him be who he wants to be. And if he wants to prove it's great, we'll use his knowledge if it's beneficial. And if it's not beneficial, we'll just dump it. Okay? We're not, we're not going to make this an Aqila issue, right? Which is what the Christians did. They made an Aqila issue and they killed him. <laughs> so we're not in persecution uh, of academics because they say something which is out of the ordinary and so on. But anyway, so now you have why. Your five senses definitely will, will say that if you have a pungent smell, right? A bad odor, then you say this is bad, hopefully. Uh, unless you're really a Khabib and you really want to live that way, right? That you were dirty and filthy and, uh, and you say this is good and there's something wrong with you, right? Hopefully most human beings will agree with that. Yeah. Or you say that something looks good 
and looks beautiful and so on, feels good and so on. But anyway, the senses can only get you so far. Then the mind will come and tell you that I believe this is good or I believe this is evil, which is a huge debate. As I said, through Aristotle and his virtue ethics and so on and so on. So there the discussion is, is good because it's good or is good because it is appropriate for the community and society at that time and all of that. Right. So three Muslim schools. In the discussion of good and evil, we have three approaches uh, that have been given to us through the theologians. The study of theology is of immense importance, and especially classical theology. Nowadays, people say, we don't need classical Islam and scholarship. We say, then you don't have Islam. Islam is on the back of classical scholarship, definitely not on the back of modern scholarship, because modern Islamic scholarship, first of all, doesn't exist, and number two, it knows diddly squat about the issues that are pertinent to Islam. You know, there are some good individual scholars, mashallah, in the world, but not as a community, not as a society of academics. And so, on. so you have three Muslim schools in classical Islam who have discussed this issue. The first group are those that have been um, dubbed as rationalist, but they're anything but rational. They're called the Mu'tazilite. So the Mu'tazili school is a school of thought in Muslim theology, and their basic premise is that the mind contextualizes wahi. That's what they believe in. So there was a group of Muslims who actually believed this, that you may contextualize the Qur'an through the mind and the intellect. The intellect will tell you the meaning of this ayah, or the meaning of this word. So they see the mind and the internet as a referee, and they were called the Mu'tazili. So it seems that they're rational, uh, but in behavior they were very, very militant. Who imposed the uh, Inquisition on Imam Ahmad? The Imam Ahmad went through an Inquisition, you know, the first religious Inquisition was enacted by this group of Muslims. These Mu'tazilites were the ones who now persecuted Imam Ahmad for holding the true belief that the Qur'an is uncreated. So in practice, the Mu'tazilites were fanatics, they were purists, and they were very, very militant. But their theory was rational. Contradiction of terms. Yeah. Right. Like I said, they're dubbed as rashes. That's what the Orientalists want you to believe. So you mustn't believe anything the Orientalists say. They don't know anything and they have a very different agenda. Anyway, what I'm saying is the more Disney believe that the mind is able to determine good and evil as absolute. That was their position. So as a Muslim you must know lying is wrong, cheating is wrong, Telling the truth is good, and all the other values of morality, the mind must appreciate and come to terms with. They didn't give you the luxury of wahi. They said, never mind wahi. Pre wahi, the mind is capable of determining whether this is good or this is evil. So they placed the primacy of the mind intellect above everything else, and this is how they developed their theology. Yes? Um, if, if they placed the mind above Wahi, what was the role of Wahi in their philosophy? Like he just gave the particulars? Yeah, Wahi was then to guide you in matters of uh, ritual worship <coughs> and general moral values you know, and behavior and also uh, you know societal values and so on. But they said good and evil is absolute. The mind is able. To, mind is able. The sound mind. Okay, you have to have that caveat there, right? And that's why they were Puritans. They were purists. The sound mind is able to determine good and evil before wahi, independent of wahi, which is very unique 
but it's impossible to achieve because, first of all, you don't have a sound mind. Nobody except the prophet has a sound mind. Right? Yeah. Anyway, any questions on this? What, um, I don't know if this is outside of the scope of the... But then what... Um, how did that make them, like, militant or... How did that philosophy turn them into, like, give them that fanatic, militant, like, worldview? Yeah. I'm just wondering the, if it's, like, related to what's yeah, happening that, that, now. That's a good question. How did it make them fanatical? Yeah. Well, that well, it is, it's because of other factors. Mm -hmm. yeah. they, they said that the human being is responsible for his own salvation through the mind. Right? So if the human being doesn't behave appro appropriately, then the human being has to be uh, conditioned or disciplined. Mm -hmm. And obviously that's through force. Mm -hmm. right? So later on, some of them, meaning the, the, because of the Kharijis, they were an offshoot of the Kharijis, basically. We won't talk about the Kharijis now. But the Kharijis believed that a sinner is an un-Muslim. Right? That's what they believed. The Mordazini came and said, no, they're not non muslim but they're not Muslim either. Okay, so not, they're not welcome in the community. But we won't say they're non muslim Right? They're in the months of the Bain of as they say. They're in between the two which obviously makes them Puritan and very fanatical, that if you're not going to pray on time, we're going to punish you, right? And they would take people off the streets for committing sins and, and imprison them, if not kill them, and so on. So in that sense, it's very, very militant, and so on. But that's their history. In fact, we accommodated them, the Sunnis, accommodating the Mu'tazili, the Sunnis did not declare these people as scars. The Mu'tazili, that's the accommodation that the Sunnis brought to the table, right? But here, now, if, if you're going to say that these were rationalists, then uh, people will say the Mu'tazili premise is that uh, we have supremacy of the mind and primacy of the mind, we don't need wahi, and that was not their position. They said we need wahi, but we don't need wahi for these issues. Nowadays, people jump on to the bandwagon of saying they're Mu'tazili without knowing what the mortars that is believed in. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, so they say, yeah, in this country we can use the mind intellect and whatever the mind intellect tells us is going to be good or bad. That was not their position. Their position was that morality is already defined in the primordial existence of human beings. And the mind is there to uncover that. And therefore, you cannot promote any evil in any society. There you go. The second approach is not the Mount of the Ashari, the one at the, the bottom. The Ashari approach is the second position we have from Abu Hassan Ashari, Rahimullah, who came in the third century, the founder of the Ashari school of thought in theology. A wonderful human being and a great pioneer in uh, discussing uh, scholastics and dialectics and polemics and you know all of the rules of engagement in theology. He was previously a Mordazili, then he uh, shifted camp and he became an advocate of the Sunni positions in Kalam and then he spent the rest of his life okay, uh, basically um, trying to disprove the Mordazili position on everything. Anyway, so Abu Hassan Ashari and his followers, they say about good and evil that uh, good and evil are subject to wahi. Wahi is what's going to tell you this is good or this is evil. Meaning that he says the mind is not capable of ascertaining whether or not a specific act is good or evil. Wahi comes and tells you that it is good or it is evil at that time. So he says that it is what he based, absolutely. But for instance, lying. So he says, I'm not going to appropriate any value to lying. I will say that if there's an occasion where the Sharia says lying here is okay, then I will say it's okay. 
and most occasions the shari will say it's not okay. So on most occasions I'll say it's not okay. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Meaning that Ibrahim Islam, when he lied, the Ibrahim lied three times, right? In the hadith in Bukhari, he lied three times. Okay. Now, tell your Sunday school the students, it's good to lie because Ibrahim <coughs> lied. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it must be a joke. No. But Ibrahim Islam lied. Why did he lie? So there the Sharia came and said it's okay for Ibrahim to lie. So there he's not evil or he's not absolute. So it is conditional. And that was the point of Imam Ashari. That uh, the fiqh will come in and tell you that this is okay or this is not okay. And that is going to be what he based. And therefore he said the mind is not capable of ascertaining the absoluteness of good or evil. So that is the, the second position which is the Ashari position. The third position is that of the Maduridi uh, slash Hanafi. Yeah. The Maduridi position is that there is an absolute value to morals, but the uh, determination of whether an act has sin or reward, that comes from Wahi. So it's nuanced. It takes on some of the more desert angle and it takes on some of the ashari angle. It's very nuanced, it's very organized and very disciplined. So they say that in principle lying is bad, it is evil. But sometimes if the sharia says that in this case there is no sin in lying, then the element of sin is determined by wahi. The element of sin is determined by wahi. And likewise, the element of reward is determined by wahi, which is quite amazing because what he has done, well, obviously this came from Abu Hanifa himself in some way or form, uh, that the mind doesn't have access to what happens in the akhirah. Right? As I said in the beginning, the mind doesn't have access to what happens in the Akhirah, only Wahi can tell you what happens in the Akhirah. So he appropriated what was valuable in the dunya through the mind, and he also appropriated what was valuable in the Akhirah through Wahi. So his position is much more nuanced than the others. So you have this now uh, scheme of understanding whether good or evil is absolute or relative. So, now this is fundamentally crucial in order for us to understand the philosophy of a Muslim system of education. Because you're going to be saying, what do we teach? If we're going to teach morality, then which morality are we teaching? Is it that of the Mu'tazili? Is it that of the Ashari? Or is it that of the Maduridi? Which one are you going to go with? You can't cross over and say, we're going to take from all three because that doesn't work. There'll be a short fuse, you'll explode. Right? It doesn't work. So you're going to have to pick one of these in order for you to say that this is the, uh, the position we take. Whichever one it is, then you must stick with it all the way throughout the curriculum. You can't change it halfway. In high school, we'll go with the Ashari, or we'll go with the Mordazari, but in middle school and elementary, we'll go with the uh, Ashari, whatever. Right? You can't do that. You have to be consistent throughout the whole schooling system and that this is the approach that you need to take in order to say that this is good or this is bad. So now, uh, obviously that comes down into the different issues in fiqh. Those are details of the sharia, but these are the principles upon which the sharia is going to be based. You see where I'm going with this? You understand why this discussion is a step before the discussion of the curriculum, which I warned you about at the beginning. Any questions? Huh? You okay with this? Yes? I mean, to connect that to curriculum, uh, one aspect of the importance of something like this is just, you know, when we're trying to teach the, you know, kids or students morals, uh, you, you kind of have to be clear about which approach you're doing, so I can understand that. 
but in 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 I mean, does it? I, it's got to have an effect outside of just morals. No, it does. Uh, so so yeah. where how? Can you maybe give us well, some examples? Ma many applications has applications. Like if I'm teaching physics, is yeah. there is there a Matuidi nuance that comes into physics? You know, for, I'm just throwing out of a thousand examples physics. Um, you know, how, how how would this beyond me just teaching the morals and how they should approach moral questions? How would this affect other? Well, and I'm not doubting that it does, I'm just trying to see what that connection is. The, 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 the issue is, is the, as I, I tried to explain, the Maturi position is premised on the, the fact that the mind is not able to access anything beyond time and space. Okay? If you have that rubric and you bring it to physics, right, then you, you will not be discussing the issues of the Akhira in terms of time and time and space. Do you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. that if there's something that's going to happen in the Akhira, then you can't bring the Akhira discussion into the world discussion, discussion of the world. So your world view is your world view, but your view of the Akhira is going to be significantly different from your world view. And this is where the Mu'tasari obviously made conclusions that were totally un-Islamic. So what would, what would be a Mu'tazidi? So I, I, I understand your Maturidi division. The Mu'tazidi like position would be, for, for instance, what one group of the Mu'tazidi said that there, there is no physical resurrection because the mind doesn't reason with that. Mm -hmm. There's no need for physical resurrection. Mm -hmm. Right? So we say, the Ashari and Maturidi, we say, but the Qur'an says there's a physical resurrection, so we won't allow the mind to trump that. Right? So that's why you discuss uh, the, the, the physics of the Akhira. Mm -hmm. That in the physics of the Akhira, is there room and space for a physical resurrection, which Ibn Sina also denied. Right? Mm -hmm. So we say that we can't evaluate the Akhira in terms of the dunya, in terms of time and space. It's a different plane of existence altogether. The references are very different. Mm -hmm. So that's where you might want to you know, find fodder for the final law, stick to law, <laughs> they put into law, right? Yeah, when you're trying a case, mashallah, this is good or this is evil. <laughs> we won't go into those legal ethics just yet, but there you go. But yeah, there is application everywhere uh, as to how you're going to ascertain. It comes in bioethics. Right? In bioethics, if there's a physical resurrection and you want to donate your organ to somebody else, where are you going, brother? <laughs> Which human being will be resurrected in? The donor or the one who is being donated? No? That will be an issue. If you donate something to somebody post-mortem and your body, heart or organ ends up with somebody else on the Day of Judgment, you don't have that organ. Or the other person has the organ. Theoretically, there's a question. We don't make too much of it, but if you want to understand theory, then theoretically that's a question that we ask in bioethics all the time. And based on that, some people will say, well, then donation is no good because I don't want to be resurrected on the Day of Judgment without one of my organs. Possibly, right? Maybe that's the fatwa people give, maybe it's not, I'm not discussing. I say fatwas, I'm saying the theory in academia is this but it's premised on this discussion. Is the mind able to ascertain things that are going to happen in the Akhira? Meaning, is organ transplant, is it good or evil? That's the question. So that you're going to go through these three. In Islamic uh, legal philosophy, you're going to take one of these three positions to ascertain the fatwa, and whatever it is, it is. That makes sense? So now you, you've included law now into the discussion. Yeah. Anything else? Okay. Yes? Uh, this is a small question about Asherites. Do they believe a sound mind can ascertain morality? No. Okay. No. They don't. So the question with the donor example that you gave, if you were to go through each one, what would be the first stance? 
like what would the Nintendo would say, what would the actually say, and what mm. the Nintendo would say? Yeah, I mean that with the Maturidi actually the question they will ask is that is there something in Wahi that tells us this is wrong? Right? In order for the Maturidis in order for it to be sinful and for the Asharis in order for it to be good or not so good. So, you know, if you find a hadith or something, then you'll be you know, um, you'll be asked to follow the evidence. So it'll be evidentiary. It's called evidentialism, basically, you know, in our approach. So you follow the evidence, and based on the evidence, you say, well, this wahi tells us that it is good or evil. Mm -hmm. The Mu'tazali will say, you have to ascertain it through your mind anyway. Whatever you conclude will be good. Mm -hmm. yeah. So they may have a more relaxed position, but then the mind is relative. Because someone's mind may say it's good, and another person's mind will say it's not good. So who's going to be the judge between the two minds? A third mind. So this is kind of, it comes back to this vicious circle that everybody's mind is judging everybody else's mind, which is what happened with the Greeks. They became splinter groups. And this is what happened with Mortazili. They have so many splinter groups within their system of thinking. Any other questions? Yes. One way you articulated the Mu'tazili position was contextualizing wahi. Um, you say you're not here to give fatwas, but it's clear that the Mu'tazili are to be rejected. Uh, the way you presented it, I'm, I'm not here to defend their position either, but I'm just trying to understand better. Um, I mean, isn't there some validity to the idea that wahi needs to be contextualized? To pick out of a thousand examples just a simple social hot button type issue, Slavery, for example, uh, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't um, outlaw slavery. I think it's a reasonable argument to say that it was too radical of a thing in Arabia at the time for him to outright outlaw it, and so there was a concession made as long as slaves were treated okay and so on and so forth. But due to a lot of human suffering that has resulted from slavery, and I think the Muslim world has come to a consensus due to colonialism that slavery is bad or else we should accept that the British overruled half the Muslim world at some point. So isn't there some legitimacy to some context and historical experience based notions of what is right and what is wrong with, with while recognizing that it's not absolute because it's not wahi based? Or well, that, because that, the Prophet you, was willing to give a social concession to slavery if we interpret it, it, the way he dealt with it that way, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Therefore, at, at all times, we must be willing to make a social concession to, to slavery. And, you know, it's perfectly fine for ISIS to have sex slaves and so on and so forth. Well, I don't know about the, the last statement. Well, it's, 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 it's inherent, I think, if, you're, if, if we must always be open to the possibility in society, if a certain society wants to force it to, we're going to re-resurrect a dead social practice, then I, I must be open to the fact that that's okay, right? I mean, isn't it inherent? Well, I'd, I'd be more concerned about what you write in your history books. About okay, sure. Muslim history and slavery, which is obviously totally distorted in the way Americans uh, write, um, you know, chapters on Islamic history, right? Mm -hmm. So from that point, from, from an educational point of view, that point is valid. I can see that in our textbook that we have, slavery is mentioned uh, as part of Muslim society and Muslim history, and how, how do we validate that, justify that? So from that point of view, the discussion is valid to bring it down to, you know, the workshop here, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So there, there is that. Uh, but the, the, that, that, that your, your position would be okay if that's what the Mu'tazili believed. But the Mu'tazili didn't believe that. They believed slavery was good. Sure, sure, fine. But I'm just saying, the idea that wahi can be contextualized sometimes, maybe, is no. not a valid thing. No, no, or is no, that no. inherently invalid? Yeah, no, no. Uh, okay, let, let's go back to the, uh, the beginning. When the Mu'tazili say that uh, the mind contextualizes wahi, it's in matters other than law. It's in theological matters, <coughs> right? In law, they were Hanafis, the Mu'tazili. 
Right. If you look into the history of all the mortals, 95% of all the mortals, they were Hanafi in law. And they, they conceded that the only law they could follow was the law of Abu Hanifa, because the law of Abu Hanifa actualizes the role of the intellect and the mind and the rationale when it comes to determination of law. So that philosophy is there in the modern But when it came to theology or theism, they said the mind is going to contextualize issues of theism and theology. And that's where we disagree. So you, can, you can't use the mind to determine who Allah is, what he is, and how he is, and so on. That is based on your iman and your qidah. It's not based on your aql. So that's the distinction we make there. Now, <coughs> to answer your point, there definitely is room to say that in certain matters of law, you, you may be a privy to to, to contextualization uh, if you follow the rules. There has to be a system by which you're going to say this rule may be contextualized and this rule may not be contextualized. Then you're going in a discussion of postmodernism, which we don't want. Not here. Anyway. Okay, I don't know if I'm misunderstanding something, but um, if the necessity conclusions were not accurate, why is this rule still being still valid? Is it the process that we're using or is, is it? Because it comes up in uh, academic discussions. Mm -hmm. That's why. This is all academic. You know. It may not come, up, come uh, into your discussion, but in, in another conference or seminar, he, people will be uh, kind of bombarding you with a more deserving position. You should be aware of that as educators. What is the model of the position? That's why, as I said, we're taking a step back uh, just to understand the philosophy behind the philosophy and so on. Yeah. Any other question? No? no? Finally, inshallah, for this session, how do these theories apply? How, how do we bring them all together? I think we've had samples of that in the uh, question and answer, inshallah. Okay. But there you go, okay. the discussion on, first of all, the epistemology, and secondly, the role of the mind, and why vis-a-vis -vis the determination of good and evil, and how, how we as a, a group of Muslim educators are going to come to the table and say, in our philosophy of instruction, uh, are we going to use the absolute rule of good and evil, or are we going to use the relative rule of good and evil? as we impart or we write the textbooks for the curriculum, right? Because that is going to determine how you write. Your philosophy is going to determine how you're going to present good and evil. And good and evil will be something independent of society. So uh, when Islam says that drinking <coughs> is wrong because it's a sin, right? How are you going to present that in terms of, you know, American law? of the American society and uh, the civilization. So there you're going to find yourself in somewhat of a handicap if you don't know how to write this. And everything else that's wrong in, um, you know, in the society here. And then also everything else that's right in the society. How are you going to present that? Right? There's something right in this civilization and this is good. Then how are you going to present that? Are you going to present it from the Maturidi or the Ashari or the Mu'tazili? That all helps you, uh, hopefully, evaluate your methodology of instruction and also the philosophy. Yes? I'm sorry. Uh, just to clarify for the Maturidi position, um, you, know, you mentioned that the, the good and evil is sort of what we, uh, you know, we don't know in the sense that the mind doesn't have a access to the Akhra. But uh, were you saying that in... For example, something is, is in principle evil, so that means that the mind can arrive at the general principle that something is evil. Yeah, that's so like, the mind's really so, position. So that's, so that's yeah. accessible to the mind. Yeah. But then there might be like some issues like slavery, maybe that, well, maybe minds change, or, or, or uh, there's, I, I, I no. mean, I guess there's, there's general things that many minds can agree on, and there's others that... Well, that would be the issue. That yeah. the, the, owning a slave is that sinful. Right, we, okay. right, so that can change in the sense. Yeah, so that won't change. We don't, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's we don't what the discussion is. Yeah. Like the Maturidi position and the Ashini position, we're very clear on that. Is it sinful? 
did the Prophet say it's a sin? Now, the idea is, is in, in your legal philosophy that you do want you do want to make sure that human beings are, you know, given their nobility and their respect. And as a community, as a society, through the institution of Ijma, uh, we may be able to say we have now abolished slavery. That's fine. Because that's a process through the legal system of Islam that you're going to say we no longer recognize slavery through Ijma. That's one way we would do it. So you would almost go through like oppression or, or what it's leading to or looking at, meaning in, in law you would look at uh, sort of just the results of something or, or like slavery isn't <laughs> sinful but maybe in, in certain contexts it's... Yeah, well, what I'm saying, this, this goes with the utilitarian approach. Right. That what is the utility of slavery? Is, it, is there any utility to slavery or not? And then you're going to go into the societal anthropological discussions of why uh, slavery existed in the first place. Okay? So there you can make a case that the way we treated slaves is nowhere near what how these people were treated in the US. Okay? It is a universe of a difference. I mean, Muslim slaves in Muslim countries want to remain slaves because of the privileges they received. Okay? So that's that discussion with anthropology. Okay? Then there's a legal issue. The legal issue that as a community, as an ummah, if we want to, and we can, and we should, decide through the consensus of ulama, a process known as ijma, that we no longer recognize slavery as being valid. We can do that. Yeah. Right? There has to be no answer. Yeah, you, you can't make something a moral issue if it's legal. The same in this country. Okay? The question there is: that, is everything legal moral? You pay taxes, right? Is that moral? We gain independence because of taxes. <coughs> We're still paying taxes. No? So it's, what morality and legality don't necessarily go hand in hand. That's the issue. So that, that, that's where you debate in the legislature, and that's how you debate in the theory of utility and so on. Uh, and that's a legal process. It's not a moral issue, right? So we're discussing morality here. And that in morality, is that absolute or is that evil? So there you can discuss according to three positions. Right, so the two are often conflated in the, in the current context, and that's why there's... A... Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's take a break. Is it break time? What time is it? It's 11.35. We'll take a break. Ten minutes. In this session, we are going to be doing something which is probably more up your alley, as they say, in England, more pertinent to you than to me, since you are educators in the field of education in this country, I thought it was a good idea to uh, have a summary of the types of schools we do have available to us in the U.S. Do you know basically what these schools are? that they arrange in terms of their funding, I would assume. So here you have public schools, charter schools and magnet schools which are basically free. And uh, the difference is, you know, magnet schools will focus on a certain type of discipline, emphasize one specialization, and they're regulated by the uh, local boards. Uh, they're usually free. <coughs> Charter school you can apply, and uh, you know the state will give you funding for the charter schools and public schools are public schools, as you know. So the source of funding will also di dictate what you teach and also how you teach. If you go with the state, and the state will have its benchmarks and you will be uh, mandated to make sure the students reach those benchmarks and the teachers will be mandated to teach the way the school 
or the state wants you to teach according to the state policy. So that's how you get public schools. Charter schools have somewhat more freedom, autonomy as do magnet schools. But basically all three are usually free. Public schools definitely, charter schools are free. Magnet schools, on the whole, they're free. Although there may be some fees assessed for certain programs, extracurricular activity, and so on. Yeah. The second type is a parochial slash religious school. Parochial is when uh, there is a religious school which is funded by a higher authority or uh, institution like the Catholic schools are parochial. They are funded by the archdiocese and so on. Religious schools are private that you are going to be funded by your private donors or your the fees from the uh, students who will pay for some of the expenses and so on. There you do have the freedom of choosing your religion, imparting knowledge that is religious based and that's why they are important because uh, people want to make sure that their children are given a moral understanding through the religion and not through the state. And that's our discussion of morality just now obviously brings light to this uh, classification of schools and that we have private schools, boarding schools, etc. Boarding schools, they can concentrate on more extracurricular activities and the details of life. They want to raise the child as a wholesome child with everything that the child will need in order to become a full-fledged adult in private schools. As you know, they're funded by private donors and they have tremendous flexibility in what they teach and so on. Montessori schools, as you know, focuses on the abilities of the child. I'm sure most of you are aware of that. Language immersion schools is where you're going to take a secondary language and then concentrate on teaching the secondary language as a medium of instruction and so on. So you have the certain schools. You do have Arabic immersion schools in the country somewhere on the East Coast, right? Now, there's one famous one there. The name is not coming to me, but there's a language school just for Arabic. And they, they all talk and immerse themselves in Arabic, which is now you're going to be based on, you know, speaking the language. Usually they're for diplomats or they're for uh, people who want to get into the field of Arabic for commercial reasons or for, you know, diplomatic reasons and so on. So they do work and they have a certain expertise that's required and so on. Okay. But um, again, that curriculum is going to be almost uh, autonomous. Special education schools, some of them are private, some of them are public, and uh, the, the uh, school is going to focus on those children that, that are handicapped or they don't have the required skill sets or the attention that's needed in order to function as a normal, regular, quote unquote, hmm, excuse the uh, terminology, it's offensive, but you know, that kind of public school, regular public school uh, students. So you have special education schools, they're very specialized, it's an art, it's a skill set to be able to teach these uh, uh, types of children. It's a great service to those who are disabled and handicapped and so on. I put in two other schools uh, which are of intrigue, especially the Waldorf. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Emilia school says that basically the child has a thousand languages and it can develop it into anything you want the child to develop into. That's one philosophy. The Waldorf philosophy is intriguing because that philosophy says the first seven years of a child is supposed to be where he's just enjoying life. And that will resonate somewhere. That ring a bell in the prophetic hadith of the Prophet them instruct your children for Salat when they reach which age? Seven. I mean, for the first seven years, don't regulate them. Nowadays, mashallah, everybody wants their child to be Abdul Qadir Jilani as soon as they're born. 
which is a myth. You can't hope that, and you should not expect that. And that's just outrageous. It's a vul, meaning the first avenue, the child should enjoy childhood. That's their philosophy. It's intriguing, I put that there as an independent type of school to show you that people do think this way. In Ibn Sina's philosophy of childhood instruction, he says the same thing, primarily based on hadith of the Prophet. He said that you should not teach the child anything until the child is seven years old. I'm not suggesting to you that you do this, I'm just saying that theory is there. If you want to benefit from it, and maybe think about it, where you're not going to bring in certain rules of you know, strict education or strict academics until the child knows how to be a child. Um, so I do have some reservations about how our parents school their children from a very early age, and that, those are my opinions. So, yeah, I keep them to myself. Yeah, yeah the um, next section. Any questions, sorry, on this one? You probably know most of this, as I say. Um, this is what's available. You probably have other types of schools, depending on the funding and so on, but these are the broader you know, kind of classifications, categorizations of schools based on funding. Mm. Different philosophy of schooling, this is very dream that, as I said, every school needs a philosophy. Uh, unfortunately, in my experience, I have found that Muslim schools don't have a philosophy. Right. When I go and talk to principals and directors and boards, what's your philosophy of education? They say, what is that? What's the philosophy of education? Our philosophy is that we want to give Muslims an environment in which uh, they will not be seen as second-class citizens. Which is very reactionary. It's not the way you educate people. They will give a safe environment in that they will be able to do uh, the Salat al dhuhr mashallah, in time, and they'll understand what is halal and haram, and there'll be a Muslim ethos in the school, and so on. Which is, you know, it's fine, it's a, it's a byproduct of you being Muslim. It's not the reason why your school exists, hopefully. As a Muslim, you're going to have this anyway, right? As a Muslim, you're going to pray, hopefully. Right? As a Muslim, you're going to eat halal. As a Muslim, you're going to stay away from haram, hopefully. So that's just the byproduct of being Muslim. It's not your philosophy of education. Your philosophy of education is how you go to school. The child, schooling, <coughs> as opposed to educating. There's a subtle difference there in the terminology. Schooling means that you are going to see, help the child become a wholesome, comprehensive uh, child and also an adult with a very holistic approach to his or her life. That's what schooling is, from the word school. Education, you impart knowledge. Bits of information here in math and science and English and history. Those are now portals of uh, information. They're not, you're not necessarily schooling the child. So these are some questions that people pose uh, for teachers. Why am I doing this? Uh, what is life? Who am I? Uh, what is my purpose? What is really good to do? and so on. These basic essential questions might be questions you may want to ask yourself. Um, why all of you in education? Anyone want to discuss a novel idea as to why you're in education, why you're teaching? Those of you in homeschooling, I know why you're doing what you're doing. Uh, something to think about. Uh, evaluating yourself is necessary. You must be able to evaluate yourself. There must be some introspect in, in every phase of your life to say, okay, what am I doing? Who am I? I'm not saying you don't do. You continue doing what you're doing, but you must evaluate. That is known as muhasaba in our culture, right? In our culture, we have the theory of muhasaba, introspect, that you're making hisab of yourself. Who am I? What am I doing? Why am I doing what I'm doing? Am I sincere in what I'm doing? Am I doing this out of altruism, love, compassion? Am I doing for this for money or for career development? Which is fine. You can do this for career development, but be honest about it. There's nothing wrong with that. 
It's perfectly fine. You're doing this for because it's a second job. But be honest about it. It's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. But this is introspect is necessary because that's going to motivate you to perform better, inshallah, hopefully. What is reality and all of that and good stuff. Now, these issues, I'm just going to very quickly browse through those and, uh, you know, you can look them up, you can discuss those later on. But uh, th these are some of the, you know, um, basic philosophies of education that people have uh, nowadays. As you can see, they're not really way based, but they're kind of intriguing. You have essentialism where you want to make sure that the student has command over the core subjects in the curriculum and you teach them to become masters of the field and so on throughout your 12 years or 13 years of schooling or education. Progressivism is where you're going to help the child uh, develop and adapt and appreciate change in life and it's a kind of making sure that you don't dictate on the students any moral values, okay, which is now, in Obama's time, this was the norm, the progressive system. I don't know what's the norm anymore, but anyway, there you go. And Mr. Trump doesn't seem to have a norm. Perialism, where the basic understanding of philosophy is that all human beings have the common core essential values, and it's all about the teacher controlling the classroom and the students and that's how they appropriate their philosophy and so on. Existentialism is where it's on the experience of the child. That the child must experience what is life and so on. And behaviorism is about the behavior of the child. You develop the child individually and so on. Anyway, so these are very broad ideas that I brought to the uh, Table. Now I want to uh, proceed into uh, proceed into the third session, uh, so that we get a head start into the third session. It's probably the most important session of all. Are there any questions before we go on? Yeah. Um, may I share my philosophy of why I'm in education? Sure. And maybe you can critique it. Yeah, as, sure. As you're prone to. Um, for me, a wise person once said that uh, imagine you had all the money in the world, you get it, and then what happens next? You're, you're, what you want is the money. What happens is, once you've attained all that, you feel despondent. So what gives you that satisfaction in life is service. And then he detailed that there are three types of services that are the greatest services. The first one is a service to humanity, reforming people. And I did not have that caliber to be able to reform people. And the second one he said was be able to heal people. And I couldn't heal people because I'm not a doctor. Then he said, teach people. I'm like, I think I can do that. And that's why I became a teacher. Okay. Very good. Yeah, Unless you do and I just show. Maybe successful. Mm -hmm. Yes? I just had a question about these to the extent you're willing to engage it. But if we're out of time, that's fine. Mm -hmm. On each of these, I mean, could you briefly say from your personal opinion or slash from your, what you think an Islamic worldview would be, what's something negative, and if there is anything positive about each of these, what they would be? Yeah, I mean, we, we, we do have a sense of, you know, essentialism and behaviorism. We do have that. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the, in, in the theory of education, there, there was a, a, you know, a Latin American philosopher of education who, who complained in the 50s, I think. The Brazilian guy, he wrote about um, education in general and he said the nature of education nowadays in the world is that you, you treat every student like a bank deposit box. Mm -hmm. And that you enter the, the you deposit the information into the, the uh, box of the student's mind and then at the time of test, you withdraw it. Uh, it's a very stagnant, very mechanical, robotic approach to education, which is where you know people who are against standardized testing uh, say that you don't want them to become robots. 
there's obviously benefit in standardized testing. We're not against them, but the idea that you're not training the student's mind to think and to be creative inside the box or outside the box, and you're not training the student to behave and act and react in, a, in certain different um, environments or you know situations. Mm. And obviously that's where team sports build character, right? So the, the idea of team sports, although unfortunately in the US it becomes, you know, kind of fanatical, right? Team sports is uh, their life, basically. <laughs> You want to be on the basketball team, you want to be on the football team, you want to be on this thing, this thing. So team sports, if it's taken out of context, and you get the USA, basically. But team sports, if it's to build character, and understand teamwork, and understand that sometimes you're going to lose, and sometimes you're going to win, and it teaches you life, and sometimes, you know, the coach is going to shout at you, and sometimes the coach is going to, you know, be, be pleased with you, and so on. Okay, that builds character. So now, that's what about schooling and schooling them. You, know, you make sports part of your schooling uh, as part of the learning curve and so on. So we, we, do have, we have some elements, but that's what the next discussion is about. Um, you kind of preempted the, the next discussion. <laughs> yeah. Islamism. Mm. So that Islamism, what is our philosophy on? education. So the first question obviously, is there such a thing as an Islamic ism? You know. So here we have to be very careful. Uh, before we go out on a limb and say that we want to standardize Muslim curricula everywhere in the world and we want to make sure that everything is monolithic and everybody is on the same platform, unified and so on. We have to first of all identify you know, the real meaning of Islam, what is Islam, and what are the grades of Islam, and the levels of Islam, both at a functional level and also at a theological level. Okay. Then how to accommodate for different schools of thought and different schools of fiqh. Basically, if there's going to be one monolithic curriculum. Uh, so it's so a big discussion, huge discussion. I think we should be clever uh, and not emotional about the issue. Now, in, in, um, you know, in your, your hard sciences, right, in your math, and to a certain extent maybe in English also, and uh, sometimes in history, you're going to have a, a standard which is going to be somewhat universal. What do I mean? I mean, if you study math in India, you can work here in the Silicon Valley, right? What does that tell you? The math they learn is universal. I would assume, right? They're applying the same math they learn there, here. That's why they get jobs here. Mashallah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, um, but uh, you can't say that about, uh, you know, necessarily uh, philosophy, right? You can't say that about English and so on. No, obviously your standard is your degree bachelor's level, master's and PhD and so on. That might get you a job, it might land, land you an interview and so on. But the curriculum is going to be very diverse and so on. But, so in certain fields you're going to have a universal standard uh, where that standard will be applied everywhere in the world and there are going to be other subjects where the standard is not universal, is going to be appropriated according to the country and um, you know the place and the um, you know the industries of that particular country so in, if you go to britain or most places in europe they don't require you to have a bachelor's degree in order to work at a very high level you just have your a levels and you get a very good job mashallah if you have a bachelor's that's wonderful and if you have a master's then they say you know just continue studying <laughs> They don't care, really. I mean, the industry is not set up that way, that you've regulated the schools according to your industry. They don't necessarily reflect each other. Whereas in the US it seems that way, that the industry reflects the degrees. And so it seems that way. Well, I don't know. 
That's what it seems to me from the outside. So now, in a Muslim educational system or Muslim uh, Islamic studies and other studies curricula, are you going to have a universal, standardized benchmark for each grade and each subject, or are you going to make this diverse or, you know, pertinent to the people of that particular country? Okay. That's one question. In order to understand and perhaps answer this question, we must ask that uh, are there levels of education in Islamic studies that we need to appreciate. So, so you, you have a Fardayim level, right? Everybody knows that from the Hadith of the Prophet so You have a basic level of Islamic education, which is called Fardayim. Every Muslim must know this for his or her salvation and for his uh, or her performance of Islam. The five pillars are there, and then basic aqaid are there, and then the issues from the basic rule, you know, information of seerah are there, and you need to know what the Quran says in general, and so on. Then the fardayin, there's a the fardayin level. Um, that should not be part of the, um, you know, your high school curriculum. Right. That's something you do by the age of seven. That should be in the air, that should be part of your home culture and environment. You don't need to spend so much time on that, teaching that, that the parents should take care of that. Ideally, ideally the Fardai must come from the parents, and that is the meaning of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saying, instruct your children for Salat when they reach the age of seven, meaning by the age of seven they should know all this, and at least by the age of ten they should know the Fardai. That's what the Hadith actually means. So in that way, you already have set the bar very high for at least Islamic studies. And you know that in your Islamic studies, you're going to be including a recitation of the Quran, and you're going to be including you know, some uh, applications of fiqh, and obviously your basic aqidah, and so on. But there is another level, uh, which is now academic. And it is this academic level which now brings us to the you know, core content. Mm. So in Islamic studies, we're talking about Islamic studies here specifically. In Islamic studies, there's a core content knowledge that needs to be instructed, which is, uh, you know, as we have elements of essentialism. This is essential to the student to know this uh, level of education, grade by grade and level by level. So, before we go there, let's ask these questions. What is the purpose of knowing Islam? So the primary purpose of knowing Islam is your salvation, your najat, that you want to meet Allah with the hope that Allah will allow you to enter Jannah and save you from the fire of hell. That is the main purpose of knowing the Fardayin. That's why it's for the But there's also another purpose of knowing Islam and knowing about Islam, and that is based on the idea of increasing one's knowledge, which is why he based, and that is recommended by the Quran, is recommended by the um, Sunnah of the Prophet. So that you engage in knowledge because of your felicity. So, uh, Imam Ghazali rahmahullah, mentions this in Zahir al muddin that uh, this high level of knowledge is to not only increase your chances of salvation but increase your ranks in Jannah and your level of felicity and happiness and bliss uh, in the hereafter and to live a good life, a uh, pure life or something like that in this world so that you have this purpose of knowing. The more you know, the better it is. You know will be for you to practice and to adapt to the Islamic way and the Islamic teaching. Oh. So there, now you're going to be engaged with each other and you will be engaged with the community, engaged with the society and you will be engaged with the government and all of that. So now you go into different levels of society and then you see 
that we have basically four phases according to Shawariullah, which is, I think, a very obvious classification of the four phases of, you know, the, the, the human civilization as a society. The first is the, your domestic phase. That in the domestic phase, you need to know what you need to know in order to live in a household that is a Muslim. So that was, your father is there, except the house was a cat. Zakat may or may not be included, but sometimes it is. As Ismail and Salam was instructed to instruct his family members uh, regarding Salat and Zakat. That's what the Quran is. In this phase is, as you know, where your basic environment of the home will teach you how to be and behave as a Muslim in the domestic phase. So you have some interaction with each other, brothers and sisters, siblings, parents and grandparents and cousins and all of that, so you need to know all of that in this space, and now you develop in your curriculum some important issues pertaining to this space of the Muslim's life as he or she progresses in the community and society. Right. That's what, so now, when we write a curriculum, we're going to be writing about these issues. Hmm. The second phase is uh, what I have paraphrased uh, as being the, the local, um, just to give you a better understanding. But the terminology is slightly different from Shawariullah's terminology, but it's a, I, I, I've termed it as a local phase. And that in your local community, what do you need to do in order to exist as a local Muslim community? So there you might have some rules of trade and commerce and some rules of police and some rules of khada, basic khada, basic you know, court rulings or something like that, and the rules of Jum'ah, the rules of distribution of uh, wealth and zakat, and all of that. This is the space where now you're going to uh, accommodate and you know entertain the idea of a local community. So you have a local masjid. In the local masjid you need an imam, and you need teachers, and you need builders, and you need plumbers and engineers and all of that. Whatever a local community needs in order to exist now, you will say that you can't have a local community if you don't have a national community. But there may be places in the world where the only pe people only live in villages, uh, independent of the state. So that's not necessarily an absolute statement. There are many villages in Africa and in Asia where they only have their own local system of life, of tribal, albeit, or communal, albeit, and that, there you need that knowledge of Islam, which allows you to behave as a local Muslim community where the rules of engagement with each other are very necessary. Known as the Muhammad, you're dealing with each other, and so on. So you develop mm, a system in your curriculum where you're going to now progress into the local phase of a Muslim's life. And there's just so much to that. Right? Imam Ghazali and others before him and after him have said that whatever is needed in order to um, um, maintain a local community is for the fire. So if in your community you don't have a doctor, then the whole community will be sinful. And if in your community you don't have an alim, then the whole community will be sinful. And in, in your community you don't have other uh, facilities or facilitators, the whole community will be sinful. I think it's a wonderful way to express how Muslims engage, first of all with each other, and secondly with the community, so that the community thrives and prospers. And this is the way we developed our communities in the Muslim Commonwealth, in our civilization. This is how we were, and this is what made us Muslim, basically. Right? So there are all of those rules and applications, which, uh, by the way, is all Wahi based. <laughs> You'll be amazed as to how much knowledge there is in the books of Fiqh. People don't like Fiqh for some odd reason, I don't know why. But uh, the amount of knowledge and wealth and treasure that there is in the books of Fiqh is mind-boggling. It's a miracle, obviously, and that they actually wrote articulated, defined, and then address all the issues 
of a community or be it a local community. Uh, so now, that is how we, we, we gauge our Muslim civilization from all the way from Spain to China. We have one big whole commonwealth, right? Which brings us to the third phase, which is almost like your national, although the nation state is kind of new invention by human beings. But for the sake of terminology, you'll we'll call it the national phase, the country phase. Now, you can imagine how much knowledge you need in order to understand how the national phase works. Your courts, your judiciary, uh, your police, your admin, your governance, your education, and you know how the madrasas and the masajid, how they work and operate in order for you to engage uh, to this national level, you <coughs> get everything under the sun, basically. And you need to appropriate all the knowledge that is needed in order for a country to run. Next, let's take for instance um, two hadith of the Prophet Since we are emphasizing the idea that all of this comes from wahi based knowledge, the Prophet mentioned okay, now um, two hadith. One hadith is Talab al Ilmi Faridatun, Ala Kulli Muslim, seeking knowledge is an obligation for every Muslim. And the other hadith is Kasb al Halali. Faridatun ba'da Faridatun Earning halal is a is an obligation after the obligation of salat. <coughs> two hadith. These two hadith will give us everything we need to do in order to create your local system of living. So as a talabur seeking knowledge, which knowledge is for? the knowledge which, which gives you Najat and salvation. How does that one facilitate this? This is the hadith. How are you going to act on this hadith as a community, as a local community? How are you going to implement this? How are you going to execute this hadith and make it easy for Muslims to uh, practice this hadith, which is the rule and the role of a government? The role of the Muslim government is to facilitate is living Islam for its citizens. That's the role of the Muslim government, basically in a nutshell. So how does now a local community facilitate this? So you will say that you need to find people who can teach people for the Ayin, which means that you need to find a college or university or an institution where you are going to prepare such people who can do this, right? They're not going to come from the heavens. The angels aren't going to come and teach you. Follow the angels. It's going to be human beings who are going to teach you. And where are they going to learn all this? Wherever you provide their education. Is that true? Yeah. So now, when you look at this and you understand that this, how are you going to practice your follow the In order for that to happen, you need to build a masjid. And who's going to build the masjid? Okay. It's not the imam who's going to build that masjid. You're going to have your engineers, your plumbers, and your electricians, and your mechanics, and everybody else. And where will you get those from? Google? No, you will need to build a college where these professions are taught. They're building blocks. Okay? Whereas in order to practice, execute one hadith, of the Prophet you need this local community. And if God forbid there's a, a, a resolution that needs to be passed, they need a court system. And God forbid if there's a crime, they need a police system. This is what the ulama meant when they said that in order for you to uh, exist, you need everything that helps the community exist and facilitate those services, which is called the kifayah. Which means that in a local Muslim community, you will have everything that uh, you need in order to take care of yourself and survive, basically. So you need to teach all those skill sets and so on. And, you know, anyway, as you can see now, you project this onto the national level, subhanAllah. Then you're talking about a civilization, right? 
they are talking about colleges, universities, they are talking about governance, they are talking about courtrooms, and you are talking about the police, you are talking about everything, the, the, the fire department, you are talking about uh, agriculture, you are talking about commerce, businesses, how you regulate the businesses in order for you to collect zakat. For instance, you need people who are skilled in understanding how business works and how the accountants work and you know how you're going to distribute the uh, you know the the, pro, the produce and how you how much zakat you're going to collect and that's a whole field in itself and where will these people be trained now let me train you the masjid that's what the, what the masjid was never the place where these people were trained it's just a myth in the minds of many muslims unfortunately that everything happened in the masjid, no Baba. Nothing happened in the masjid of Salat and teaching Islam. <coughs> that was the only role of the masjid. The masjid did not entertain schools, colleges, hospitals, administrators, that was all outside the masjid. What I'm asking you to do is think why we existed as a global civilization for a millennium. How did we do that? If we were not organized, if we were not sophisticated, if we were not cohesive, coordinated, despite all the internal wars, right? Despite those wars that we had internally, <coughs> we survived as a global civilization from Spain all the way to China for a millennium. MashaAllah. How did we do that? There must be something there in terms of um, academic support or some kind of world view that you could buy something in Spain and pay for it in China, right? How is that Commonwealth system? How do we do this? So, you know, in, in the theory of economics, you start with Adam Smith. When you study economics, who do you start with? Adam Smith, this is a British guy. 17th century, 18th century, when was he? But you discarded a thousand years of global civilization which was built on Muslim economics and you don't give credit to those thousand years and somehow you go all the way back to the Romans and all the way back to the Greeks to study economics and so there's no economics in this time when the Muslims rule the world. Right? which is pathetically dishonest and is deplorable scholarship that you've chosen to ignore the best of the best when it comes to understanding an economic system which is based on value ethics, on business ethics, on trust, on forgiveness and on altruism. These are business ethics. So we must uh, re-explore and then um, uh, rediscover the, the heritage that we had just about 100 years ago, 150 years ago, and see if we can bring those details into the discussion of these three phases. Okay? The domestic phase, your local phase, and your national phase. And if you develop that through your sciences, through your history, through your English literature, and uh, you know, through your Islamic studies and your world studies, whatever, then you will see that you will be reintroducing the, uh, you know, the tradition of Islam. And uh, the fiqh aside, we'll talk about the fiqh in a minute, but this is something that in your social studies you must highlight. Um, without necessarily having a chip on your shoulder and say we're going to prove that the Muslims were better. I mean, we were better. That's a different issue. That's not the reason why you teach to show your superiority. You want to teach the facts. These are the facts of a Muslim civilization which was global and which led the world in living. And how did we do that if we didn't have these wonderful institutions and these organizations and these guilds and these universities and these hospitals and if we didn't have the infrastructure in which and within which Muslims moved. And they moved quite a bit. Everybody traveled, right? At least they traveled to Makkah and Medina. How did they travel if there was no infrastructure? So we have to appreciate that whatever people say nowadays, 
about Islam and they want to distort Islam and they want to say that Muslims are backwards and all that. And, yeah, okay. Let's bring the facts to the table. These are the facts. This is how uh, the Prophet yeah. left us. So it is one hadith in which we say, uh, we can divide the whole empire, everything, from one hadith. The second hadith is even more intriguing. Kasb uh, al-halal, that earning halal is now a farida, an obligation after the obligation of salat. That is now how are you going to facilitate, as a Muslim local government or Muslim national government, how are you going to facilitate the means of halal earning for the citizens? You're going to have to create those industries. Yeah. You're going to have to provide for the schools that teach those industries. You're going to have to take care of the agriculture. You're going to have to take care of the economy. You're going to have to take care of the business. You're going to have to provide means by which the citizen is able to earn halal. That's how we did it. That's how we developed this global economy over a thousand years. Because we entertain the idea as rulers, we have to facilitate the earning of halal so that people don't resort to haram and they don't steal and loot and plunder and so on. So these were the organizations based on wahi. Qasbul so, halal is hadith is wahi based, is wahi. So the rulers saw that their role was to facilitate the earning of halal for all Muslims. So although we are a welfare state and there was the Bayt al but the Beit al was rarely used for those uh, who, you know, were unemployed. The Muslims always developed a sense of self-independence in the minds of Muslims, and Muslims weren't beggars until the British made them beggars, right? It's the Brits who cause all problems. <laughs> I'm from England, as you perhaps know, but I don't care about that. But until the Brits came, we were a very sophisticated society, yeah. a very organized people. We never stole. Okay. We didn't know what stealing was. We weren't dishonest. We didn't know what dishonesty was, and so on. Anyway, that's just a historical um, anecdote, if you want to call it that. But Muslims, in, in, in general, they understood that the Prophet said that you must earn halal, and if the, the country in which you live is not uh, uh, giving you the ability and facilitating for you the earning of halal, then you have to make hijra and go to another country. <laughs> right? And that's the rule. Which they never did because the country did afford everybody the ability to earn halal. And halal was seen in so many ways, obviously in commerce and business and agriculture and in barter and trade and anything else, the professions, the artisans and craftsmen and all of that good stuff. And if you want to read an account of this, you must read the Rihla of Ibn Battuta. Mm -hmm. Ibn Battuta is so valuable that he gives us an inside view of this global Muslim civilization all the way from Tangiers to China, including India. And he says on many occasions that he survived purely on the hospitality of Muslims wherever he went. He didn't need American Express. Wherever he went, people just hosted him and they fed him. And then as he left them, they also gave him gifts. Which civilization has this tradition? Uh, that you're, you're giving your, your guest uh, gifts. Today we say goodbye, don't come back. We don't even entertain guests unless we are ready for them three days in advance or three weeks in advance or a year in advance sometimes. Right? But how does this community and this civilization survive if this community was not pro-life, for life, and for the benefit and welfare of all mankind and, and so on? But what I'm saying is that the Rihla provides you an insight into the nature of society and the issue of, you know, slaves. Um, he talks about them, Ibn Battuta, that he was in Damascus. And uh, he, he was observing how people were, and once he saw that there was a young man, 
and uh, he had a broken uh, cup in his hand and he was rushing towards somewhere. So Ibn Battuta says, I followed him and I wanted to see where he was going with this broken cup. Why are you rushing with a broken cup? They throw it away. So he, he, he goes, he follows him and he says that this young person went into an office in an alleyway and then came back with an unbroken cup, very similar to the broken cup. So he's scratching his head, so what's he doing here? So he went into the office and he said, that, what do you do here? He said, he said this is for slaves uh, who have for some reason done something wrong in their homes. So if, you know, this guy came and he said, I broke my cup and if I don't tell my master, then I'll be okay and uh, my master knows that I can come to you and get this cup replaced. So insurance, <laughs> right? So I gave him a similar cup so that he can go to his master and say, uh, although I broke that one, I got you another one. Amazing! The level of altruism and generosity that existed in this civilization because we followed the Prophet ﷺ in his generosity. It was a wahi based code. Why did we behave this way? We behave this way because we are following the sunnah of the Prophet not because of some humanitarian uh, you know, jargon, but it's simply because this is who we are and this is what we are and this system affords us this type of living at this level where we see now that when you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's follow came on this ummah it lasted quite a long while, mashallah, a good thousand years, a millennium plus, alhamdulillah. Hopefully one day we'll revive that and come back to that, inshallah, one day. But what I'm saying in terms of education, when, when you appreciate that these are these three phases, or uh, phases is the best word, of uh, a Muslim's existence in the community, in society, the domestic and the communal or the local and the national, where you have these civilizational values and codes, they all come together and you appropriate a nisab or a curriculum that's going to reflect all of these three phases. This is one way you may suggest an Islamism. If there is Islamism based on education, this will be one way. There may be other ways that I haven't heard of or you may think of later on, but this is one way. So the way you're going to set off is to say that what do we want the student to know in this level of, uh, in this stage and phase of his existence and in this phase, in this phase, and you come to terms with that and you just, uh, you know, it's just a long project as we will discuss later on, inshallah. Okay. And the last issue here is this uh, intriguing question. Yeah. This is all fine and dandy when you have a Muslim civilization. But how do you do this kind of education in a non-Muslim land, which is our focus? Since we are in a non-Muslim land, which we must appreciate, we're not in a Muslim land, and we are not obligated to establish a khilaf here either. So now what do we do? So how do you develop a curriculum that's going to teach Islam in a non-Muslim land? And that is now going to be country-specific. This is where although the Fardain will be monolithic and standardized, the content of what you teach in about Islam will be country-specific where you're going to go into the country and see these are some of the academic issues and these are some of the cultural issues and these are some of the financial issues, economic issues, and you delve into that and you see how you can perhaps come up with a curriculum that's going to Hopefully, thank God, uh, the Muslims Iman and faith and practice uh, through the core content subjects at the same time is going to help develop within the student the ability to represent Muslims and Islam in the non-Muslim country. So it's twofold. So in a non-Muslim country there, is, there are two things. One is the preservation of Islamic knowledge, which is core content Islamic knowledge, and the second is the ability to propagate and promote, represent and represent Islamic information and knowledge in that non-Muslim country so that we become engaged 
with the mainstream narrative and we engage with the community and society and we are not left behind mm -hmm. others. But that requires a lot of talent, a lot of time. There, you know, you may want to think of certain educational you know, facilitators like the Trivium in your liberal arts to incorporate uh, some of that into your methodology, maybe not the philosophy. I don't think it's the philosophy, it's the methodology that you teach you know, as you're teaching the, uh, even the Islamic core content subjects and the other sciences. And at the same time, you're going to be seeing that uh, our responsibility is to give da'wah uh, through our existence in this country, but at different levels. The different levels of da'wah, one is that you exist as a Muslim and you pray five times a day where your neighbor knows that you pray. That's da'wah in itself, which is enough for your salvation. If your neighbor knows you fast in Ramadan, then you're okay, because they already know you're a Muslim. Yeah. That amount of da'wah is enough for Muslim salvation, I would hope and assume, inshallah. Then the other levels of da'wah, you're engaging in maybe perhaps uh, some form of whatever. They call it interfaith, but whatever it is, I don't know what it is. They call it interfaith. Mm -hmm. That you're going to, you know, have lunch or something with non-Muslims and you're going to show them who you are, what you are, and uh, you have a good relationship with them and you have an active relationship with your neighbor. <coughs> and so on. that's a different level of da'a, second level. And the third level is academic, where you write papers, or you write articles, or you write books about Islam that's going to inform others about what Islam is, with the knee of da'a, not with the knee of education. So the knee will go along with so I'm writing this book so that I may explain this issue about Islam, to the non-Muslims, which is necessary, as a community is necessary, it's for the kifaya. It's not necessary on every individual, every individual must jump onto the bandwagon and start writing articles by itself, but it doesn't work that way. Not every individual is obligated to do that. One or two people from the community should be doing this, and that is enough to fulfill the obligation of for the kifaya. Some people should be engaged in uh, some form of interfaith or being kind to everybody around us and making sure that we have social events and so, but not everybody should be on the bandwagon. The problem with Muslim activists is that whenever there's a cause they want everybody to be on the same bandwagon. You can't do that. That is ridiculous. That you, you, you want everybody in the masjid to be on this platform. Come on, give me a break. It's ridiculous. You, you can't do that's not how things are done in this country. You have groups of people who do different things. As a society, everybody needs to participate in something that's Islamic, but everybody doesn't need to participate in everything. Right? Yeah. So that's how we see the participation of the community in advancing the cause of Islam uh, through, mashallah, and a good manners and good behavior, and maybe serving food or going to soup kitchens or you know, having a platform to speak uh, with, with other people. But that's a small section of the community. And then people may engage if they want in <laughs> politics if they want. I don't really care about that, but if they do, that's fine. Mm. But there are so many other initiatives that we can take with mainstream in order to show that we, we, we do have something called Al-Amru bil Ma'roof wa Nahyu al Munkar. This should be incorporated in our curriculum and in our teaching, that when we teach our children, especially at the high school level, that we, we should uh, encourage them to be part of the mainstream narrative. Now, when you're part of the mainstream narrative, that doesn't mean that you're going to concede to the mainstream position. Because after all, there's still a free country in academics. You can still disagree with most people academically, right? And you can still write against a position academically in the Supreme Court when there's a dissent. The judge has to write a dissent paper in which he says, I disagree with this decision based on this. Okay? So this country still affords the freedom of disagreeing. Muslims are afraid that if they enter mainstream narrative, they think that they'll be conceding to the narrative. No. You don't concede to the narrative, you hold your position. And you say, this is my position on this, 
which is called al-amru bil ma'ruf wal nahi al munkar. I'm enjoining the good and I'm forbidding the evil. Now this is where the maturidi ashari and Montezali physicians help you identify which route to take in mainstream discussions and conversations um, at a social level and also at an academic level, maybe at a political level. The politicians are usually they're not smart. Uh, so as I said, I really don't care for them. But if somebody does go into politics uh, with a Muslim agenda, then they may entertain such ideas also. All right. So now, in that conversation, where in your curriculum, if you have a subject called debate, right, which most schools have, I assume, this should be incorporated in your in your material that you have a, a, a class or a course on debate in English you do. It's usually done through the English courses. And that you have this thing called debate. And in those debates you're going to be addressing issues that are mainstream concern, abortion, or you know, the rights of gays, or or whatever is the the current trend. And you're going to prepare those students to debate for or against, and that should then, then you bring in your wahi-based position, and then you train them to defend the wahi-based position. And that's your contribution to the mainstream narrative, and uh, how you're going to engage in writing, articulating, in, in, in speaking, and also in writing books and journals eventually. And this at the high school level, you may have this kind of discussion. Now then, obviously, the Muslim student will need to know, first of all, uh, the, the English grammar, logic and rhetoric. Okay, then he'll, know how, he'll need to know how to debate, and then he'll need to know how to represent Islam. So it's much more of an ordeal. For the Muslim student, it's much more work. Right? And then that's what you're here for. You're here to work. Imagine. Man will only receive anything if he works for it. So the Qur'an says, has a symbolizational value. You had a question? No? I, I did. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I don't know if you're still going to get to it or if you said it and I missed it, but you were mentioning Amr bin Ma'ruf and Nahyan al-Munkar and that the, the three schools, the Mu'atazini, Maturidi, Ash'ari, would, uh, you know, relate to this Amr bin Ma'ruf and Nahyan al-Munkar. And I didn't quite catch what, how that, yeah. that link was. So the, the ma'ruf, what is the definition of ma'ruf? That, that's what the question is. Uh -huh. Is ma'ruf, which means a known moral value, which is good, and munkar is something that is denied and rejected as a moral value. Is that wahi based or is it akal based? That's the question. So now you, you have three positions. The mu'tazili will say is what? It's purely akal based. So you may engage in mainstream, uh, discussions where you're going to bring the aqal into the discussion. The Ashari will say is now wahi based. So they will argue in favor of the wahi based position and bring their articulation to that. And the Maturini will have this. No one's approached. As, as far as mentioning as a sin, then that is definitely wahi based, but we may participate in any mainstream discussion because the mind does have a role to play in identifying the good and evil. Oh, that is how legislation works, right? Mm -hmm. In legislation, you discuss the utility of a bill, the pros and cons, and so on. Oh, that's the theory, at least. But then you have interest groups and other people come and dissuade people or persuade people one or the other way. Yes? Um, and when we talked about Martesity before, you mentioned that their, their contextualization of Wahi was about uh, the mind. Uh, um, understanding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his attributes yeah. independent of, of wahi. Mm -hmm. um, but when it came to law that they were Hanafis. Yeah. Uh, but, as, uh, so, but at the same time, the whole Muartazini approach also recognizes that the aql can understand what is good and what is evil. Yes. So isn't there a potentially a tension there between no, so this, this is the, 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 the Hanafi method and no, the this is the, the role of metaphysics mm -hmm. and uh, you know ethics, right? Mm -hmm. Metaphysics and ethics both. That above law there is ethics of metaphysics, mm -hmm. and underneath theology there is metaphysics and ethics. So that's where they operate from. 
that this is the role of the aql. They're not talking about the role of law and fiqh. They're talking about the role of aql, which precedes fiqh in their mind. Right? But by preceding fiqh, doesn't fiqh get influenced by the conclusions of the ethical? I know there's. I know ethics doesn't equal law, and law equals ethics. But yeah. neither are they so disconnected that they have. No, the, the, <coughs> you're right. But what I'm saying is that when say let, let's take a, a case, which we will do in the next session after lunch and Zohar and all, inshallah. So the, the, the case studies. So you take a case. And so now the community, mainstream community, wants to discuss now um, the legalization of marijuana. Right, as an example. So now, how, how will the Mu'tazili approach this? The Mu'tazili will say, independent of law, Islamic law, I'm going to prove that it is wrong or right. right? And the usher will say, According to Islamic law and according to what he is wrong, so I'm going to prove it's wrong. And the Maturi will say that, you know, we can go both ways. And we can say it's wrong because of uh, natural law, which what the Christians have, the Catholics. You know, there's a thing called the natural theory and the natural law, where the natural law should reflect the, the law of the church. Or you can go the other way and say, based on Wahi, we know it's wrong, so we're going to defend Wahi. So the, the matter really has a better position, I think, more room to operate than the others. But that, that's will be, that will be an example as, as to how the Mu'tazili will say that independent of what he... Now, when I go to these people, right, the, the, the uh, you know, the legislator, where does that happen here? Sacramento? Yeah. I'm going to go to Sacramento. The, the Mu'tazili is not going to present Wahi. He's going to present what? Aql. Because he says, my Aql has already told me this is wrong. So from the point of view of rationalizing the evil in legislating marijuana, I'm going to prove my point, which allows him to enter the field. Whereas the Ashri might be at a slight handicap and uh, disability, because he's going to say, based on the Qur'an Sunnah, I believe it's wrong, I'm going to prove the Qur'an Sunnah. So he has an extra step, right? So that's where the difference will come. If it's done that way, now, as I said, politicians really don't care about morality and that's right, politicians. I've just given an example that this is how it will, be, it will be done theoretically. That if you wanted to engage in mainstream activities, the Islamic paradigm gives you plenty of evidence to do so. As opposed to those who say, we can't engage with mainstream because it's all kufr. So yes? With the Mutazali point of view, um, Societal changes would impact their concepts of of thought, or new research would also impact. So, if they're rationalizing something that's revelation based, based on aql, um, if, for example, new research comes out on the benefits of something uh, versus the harms of it, would they then approach that, or would they still stay with the concept of revelation in terms of, like? let's say in terms of marijuana or substances like that. So let's say at this point, the research indicates that it's harmful, but it's at a certain point, if it comes out where research says that there are benefits to it, mm -hmm. could they then defend that position despite the fact that it might be something that's revealed as a haram, which would eventually alter the concept of wahi and revelation, right? Event, like. Yeah. Or water it down eventually. Yeah, no, no. No, that's a good point. Yeah. So, here's the thing. The Mu'tazili will always claim that he knows through his aql whether this is right or wrong. Now, he may reach that position through research or through the, 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 the theory of utility, mm -hmm. the benefits and the harms. But that's still aql based. Mm -hmm. Right? So he won't have any problem saying that there is no sin in this if he sees that his aql has told him is good. Mm -hmm. He won't have a problem with that. Despite the fact that it's, it might be revealed that, it, that, it, that it's haram? That's right. Okay. Unless it was strictly uh, explicit in the mm -hmm. Qur'an Sunnah that it's haram. 
Mm. So the, 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 these are issues where uh, the Quran and Sunnah are not explicit. This, this will be mm. where in the Quran and Sunnah is slightly vague or it, it does not address the issue. Mm. Yeah. But if it's explicitly wrong, like pork, mm-hmm. for instance, then he won't go there. Because he'll follow the wahi mm-hmm. in his law. Yeah. Okay. Right. Right. Sure. Anyway, there's so much more to cover. And, uh, yeah. The next slide is for the next session. Um. We'll pray for salat and lunch. Is that all that? Any questions? <laughs> While you were digesting your food, did you digest anything? I said. No. And you didn't digest anything, I said? There was a lot of information for me. I was trying to wrap myself around it. Yes. Just open period. Any issue or? You can before we get into this. Yeah, sure. Um, I was, and maybe it's related to this Islamic studies curriculum, but when you think about literature and art, <coughs> um, are there? It seems to me the idea of good and evil and sort of the three schools you discussed. Uh, would spill over into aesthetics and ideas of beauty. Uh, and in fact, some of the debate about good and evil is between husn and qubah, and it's the Arabic phraseology that is sometimes used. Yes, to exactly. Yes. So, so, is there, are there some principles, or does some of that spill over into notions of aesthetics, what's beautiful and what, not in terms of evil and good, but just even aesthetically to the eyes, to the five senses, as you were talking about the five mm-hmm. senses. Uh, or to the mind in terms of literature or ideas or philosophy. Can we say, there's certainly many Muslim aestheticists that historically default, but then is there a Islamic, quote unquote, is there a wahi based or wahi influenced or wahi, you know, inspired yeah. notions of aesthetics? Yeah, I mean, there, there, there are some rules, principles of basic aesthetics, where the aesthetics should go against the aqidah and Obviously, the major principles of fiqh in the demonstration of our, our beauty and art and so on. So, as you know, culture will incorporate architecture, uh, fashion, styles of dress, and also cuisine. Right? So, the, these are basically the core principles where Muslims excel in all three. So, the essence of uh, architecture is there in the, the colors, the symmetry, and the idea of the circle and the square and going around a square in a circle of the tawaf around the Kaaba. And, you know, Muslims drew a lot from their rituals and the Tibet theories based on that and the different forms of calligraphy. Okay, they're, they're a testament to the creativity that Muslims brought in to the field of calligraphy and writing and so on. And then obviously the different types of dress that was um, accommodated throughout the Muslim commonwealth where somebody in China, Indonesia, Malaysia is going to be dressed significantly different from somebody in Morocco or in Ghana or an African country and the, the Balkans and also the Arab world. So that shows the diversity with which Muslims accommodated through the principle of Sadr, where Islamic fashion is guided by the principle of sutter or not, nudity or exposure, and that's reflected in the art and reflected in uh, everything else that we do. And the various, martial thousands of types of cuisine that the Muslim Ummah uh, brought to the forefront 
I literally do the kitchen table. I, yeah, this is amazing, amazing creativity that we were able to bring for the human race. I think so. That there is, that there are some overarching principles that the Muslim um, architect, the Muslim fashion clothing designer, and also uh, the Muslim chef, they will follow. It's all based on the Sunnah. And then later on, you always had, uh, as part of art, poetry, right? Using your creativity, your imagination to represent ideals and realities. And then you had the Sufis, <laughs> who brought in whatever they brought in through the institution of Ihsan, spiritually and also physically, and so on. So you do have that. There's a whole genre of literature that's out there, if you want to research that, and it's available. Yeah. I won't be able to give you names of books, but I know it's there in the libraries and in documents and all of that. But it brings us to this, this slide here, in that is there a single philosophy that drives everything that is Muslim? So this <coughs> endeavor that hopefully we wish to embark on won't happen overnight. It may take years, if not you know, a decade or so. In order to materialize, you have to be patient. And we do have to do this, though, as part of our exercise as educators and trainers and organizers and teachers and so on. So it's the beginning, not necessarily the end. But what, 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 is there something that we can do which overarches and say, you know, is there a Muslim slash Islamic philosophy which includes all the good points of every other philosophy? and then incorporates and then generates its own life and ideology and so on. So I'm, I'm sure there is one. Uh, we can go over some of the basic precepts. The precepts of obviously Tawheed, of Risala, Nabuwa, and then the Akhira. All of these three must be incorporated in anything everything we do so that we remain Muslim, at least in theory. So I'm going to go through some, inshallah, uh, points. I know some of you were probably expecting answers to questions you may have about housebooking or Islamic teaching or whatever. Those are the details, and I did warn you that we're going to be doing the philosophy behind the philosophy. So inshallah, maybe the next time around, uh, we can have some more, inshallah, tangible mm, explanations and even products as to, as to how to get into, first of all, the overarching <coughs> curriculum of a Muslim school and then uh, an endeavor which includes most people uh, through their talents to write textbooks for each grade as an organized, cohesive effort to bring about this, inshallah. Yeah, work. So that's what we hope to do. But it's not a one-man uh, kind of endeavor. You know, I require 40 scholars, quote-unquote, 20 Muslim scholars who excel in Islamic studies and 20 from Marshall most of you guys, I guess. So if anyone's interested, you may contact me and hopefully get the ball rolling sometime. Yeah. 20 people who have knowledge of the other sciences, you bring them to one table and start writing, basically. That's the proposal from this. So um, we're trying to go around various places in the country and, you know, at least uh, open the doors of conversation. And it, won't, it won't be done overnight. But what I want to do is highlight some of the main features of this 
proposed curriculums and that you understand where we're coming from. Okay? Is there a single philosophy that's going to drive us, inshallah? So, some examples, maybe I've given these examples before, maybe I haven't, if you want to. And now discuss evolution in your curriculum as, you know, a chapter in biology or whatever. Then you must bring the Islamic point of view into evolution through a cohesive theory, not something that's haphazard. So that will be your cohesive theory now. There you're going to say, what is the Wahi based knowledge and explanation of the theory of evolution? And is there something that the Quran says, or the Hadith says, or Muslim scholars in the past have said that relates to? evolution or perhaps devolution, right? Yeah, it's fascinating stuff. So anyway, you see, when, we, when we study, the, everything's there in front of you. If you want to look at the Nusus, meaning the scripture, where there's Quran, so everything is already there. All you have to do is find it. But you'll only find it if, you, if you're looking for it. If your intention is to look for the solution, you'll find it. Because the Quran speaks to you. The Quran is a living book. It speaks to you as you're reading it. Okay, so you will find answers if you have the right niya. And obviously the ability to look, which requires that. You as a teacher, you must have some Arabic, uh, some Aqidah, some Fiqh, uh, before you start doing all this stuff. So maybe workshops where you can entertain the idea of developing these skill sets yourselves might be in order. We all believe in professional development, right? In corporate America, everyone talks about professional development, developing the individual uh, professional, likewise in, in um, you know, education, you want to develop the teacher, and public schools and other schools have this program where they're developing the teacher so this will be part of your development, inshallah. If you don't know Arabic, then maybe you should learn. And if you don't know basic aqidah, maybe you should learn. And if you don't know basic fiqh uh, through the Arabic, then maybe you should learn. And there are people who can teach you, inshallah, that Al-Qasim has a, some kind of chapter here. <laughs> it's barely functional, but I'm sure if you're interested, we can have people teach you, inshallah. But that's something you should think of, seriously, as a Muslim educator. That you, you must raise your bar of participating in the Islamic discussion. If you don't raise your bar, then you know you will be a, a teacher by career, or maybe by because uh, you know it's a need and necessity for your homeschooling. You won't be the teacher that you want to be, inshallah. So now let's take evolution. As an example, how are you going to teach evolution? in a Muslim course or as part of your curriculum, albeit it may not necessarily be Muslim, it may be just secular. Any ideas? <coughs> what are one or two points in evolution that you, weigh, you will weigh against the Quran, Sunnah, or you will bring out, bring out the Muslim position of evolution? Be no brainer. What do you think? Anyone? Yes? The origins of? And what is that? Where we come from as human beings. Where we came from? And we came from a human being. How will you uh, start the discussion? If a student came and said, that you know, the, the, the position of scientists is that maybe we didn't come from a human being or maybe we may have evolved from something else. I think it goes back to the primordial life. Okay. So there has to be that foundation. Okay, that's good. Now that you've incorporated the primordial life into your equation, where you existed where? In the Ruh, right? Yeah. But then they will say that that rule could have come in later on or maybe something else. Or even those people who 
were, you know, pre-human. They also had their own. Can then truly say that maybe monkeys came from humans? Monkeys came from humans? Yes. That's okay. devolution. Yeah. Yeah, that's one theory out there, yes. Yes? Um, I guess I would say if, if they base their evolution and all of their theories on a scientific process or method, to find the, process, the scientific process method is anything you can test. You can have a hypothesis and every single time it should be able to come out positive. So if show me a real life right now example of something that proves evolution, not and a changing of like species, not a change of like kind, but of a change of species, prove that to me now. Hmm. So that's what I would say. Okay. This one approach. Anything else? Anyone else? What did you say? Um, well, human beings. And evolution, monkeys. Yes. Well, the idea is that uh, hmm. we believe that we went from monkeys to humans because of the links between them. But well, we assume the direction of, of the evolution because that makes more sense. You would become more intelligent, you become something better. But you could make the argument the opposite as well because the evidence shows that they're linked together by correlation, yeah. but not necessarily their direction. So the direction is a guess based on Occam's razor. Yeah. Okay. I mean, that's plausible, maybe. Yeah. There is one theory there that then certain human beings were turned into apes. According to the Quran, right? That proved evolution that they were turned into apes, but those apes didn't survive. They, they were turned into apes as a punishment, and the punishment only lasts for that period. It will not be transferred into the next generation. So they didn't survive. So that's one theory. Anyway, well, what, what I would like to say is that the Quran tells us as to, uh, you know, first of all, uh, the locale and the place where Adam was created. Yeah, and Adam, well, it would appear that he was not created here on earth. Where was he created? In the heavens. In the heavens. Yeah. So that then, he was, he, although he was created from, you know, the terrestrial sources, the earth and so on, but he was not. Uh, created here on earth, he was created somewhere else, and then he was placed somewhere else, which is not on earth. And this is what the Quran would say that he was, you know, allowed to enter Jannah and so on. So you see that then evolution on earth uh, didn't happen if you say that Islamically Adam was not created here, he was created somewhere else. That be one approach through the lens of Aqidah, where you can say this, and so on. And the other issue is that Adam was in Jannah before he came to earth, and therefore that also disqualifies the whole idea of evolution, uh, basically evolution uh, through the process of mutation. But what I'm saying is that it's there in the Quran, the, these, these are facts you can easily extract from the Quran. You don't need to be a genius to do this. You just have to look. And as the discussion goes on further, then we see that, you know, in the in Muslim scholarship, there is a reference to the devolution in species. Okay. But there, obviously, you have to look much harder, and you have to be in that mode of research before you stumble upon it. The classical example is that of. Ibn Sirin, rahimahullah, in his interpretation of dreams, used the theories, theory of devolution in animals to explain the natures of certain animals mm, where uh, he cursed certain animals for not mm, coming on board or for not coming on board quick enough, not complying with his command and so on. So his theory is that certain reptiles okay, devolved you know, and he bases his interpretation on this theory. So that's there in Muslim scholarship where you know the reptiles and other species and other types of animals they they went from one good state to a superior state to an inferior state and that's why they were 
forced to crawl on the earth, otherwise they weren't made to crawl on the earth. Now this is a little some scholarship. Ibn Sirin Zatabi, very early on in the first century, and he proposed this theory in his words. So you can see that even before anyone in the West ever thought of evolution or devolution, Muslim scholars came up with this idea, albeit in the realm of uh, interpretation of dreams. It's something that we should honor. Now whether that happened or not, or whether the theory is actually good or plausible, that's a different issue. But you do find that. It works very well in dream interpretation, that theory. Now, is it, it, is, is it something that you can prove? And say, let's prove this, this way and that way. So, anyway, so what I'm telling you is that the, 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 when you go into uh, Islamic acad academics and you start researching, you'll find so many ideas are out there uh, where Muslims developed certain abilities and they also wrote on and spoke on the idea of uh, the suffering of animals and the psychology of animals and all of that, and this, this is centuries ago, basically. So there you see that there is an Islamic angle, or Muslim angle to understanding uh, something like that. And in your social sciences, the way you're going to present Adam, and Islam is not as a caveman, right? Adam was not a caveman, the first human being was a caveman. <laughs> And he was not in a cave. He was in Jannah. Straight from the Quran, Allah placed him in Jannah. Jannah is a very sophisticated, creative place of living existence. And there's no way he was in a cave. Right? He was dressed. He was not undressed. And when he committed whatever he committed, he was undressed. Right? So that shows that satar for the human being is part of the human instinct. And when he became undressed instinctively, he started to cover himself. Even before he made toba, he covered himself. So now that's in your instinct, this primordial instinct, which is known as the fitra, needs to be discussed. I think that's part of the curriculum and part of the course where the Prophet ﷺ mentioned certain values are instinctive and part of the human fitra so that you come uh, to this uh, conclusion that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created man with certain instincts that are normative and they should not change according to context and climate and society and all of that, which then will spill over into your fashion. You know, Islamic fashion is based on sutta. You can't evolve or develop Islamic fashion where there's no sutta. Is that correct? There's no Islamic fashion, it's something else. You can design clothes that are devoid of sutta, but you know, it's a free country, you can do what you want. But it won't be Islamic. So then I see how all of this comes together when you start applying the rules of Islam onto these issues. So the, the basic normative instincts of human beings should be part of your core content curriculum in the Muslim schools so that you find these values. Now, these, these core content instincts, are they normative because they're good intrinsically or is it because well, he tells you they're good intrinsically. And this is somewhere where perhaps the Asharis uh, might feel slightly handicapped. Uh, this was before Wahi. Um, Ali Salaam instinctively did a few things as a human being, not necessarily as a Nabi. And so on. So the, the Maturidi uh, position on Fitra uh, serves maybe as a guide for understanding how human beings should be and how they should behave. Uh, oral hygiene, for instance, the Prophet Sallam said is instinctive, is part of the fitra. Mm -hmm. right. 
hygiene in general is part of the fitra. And it's all mentioned in hadith, the hadith of fitra, and so on. And then also within the fitra, uh, there is the issue of tawheed. The tawheed is in, instinctive in every human being because Allah took a pact with us in the alim arwah, which I spoke of in the world of the, the spirits and the souls. And uh, we all said, yes, you are our Lord. So this shows that Tawheed is what? And primordial and it's instinctive. And based on that, Abu Hanifa says that it is necessary for every human being to come to terms with Tawheed in order to be eligible for Najat and salvation. Not the Risala part, just the Tawheed part, that he must determine, ascertain somewhere in his life and uh, in whichever language it is, he must say, at least to himself, that the creator of this universe is one. That is necessary for every human being, because Abu Hanifa says the aql has this ability. That he makes aql now primary, and he says you don't need a nabi to come and tell you that God is one. That should be instinctive. So this discussion is there very early on in the first century of the Muslim era and you can see how the Muslim scholars actually thought about this. It was very energizing and very very um, perceptive uh, for them to make this conclusion. I mean that's in the, in the discussion of Najat salvation. Who is eligible for Najat and salvation? And the Asharis obviously have a different position to that. But Abu Hanifa's position is very clear, which is a Maturini position and that is in order for someone to be eligible for salvation, they must come to terms once in their lives with Tawheed. Right. And that is based on this idea uh, that the, the, the Tawheed is primordial, is part of the human fitra, and there's no way you can escape this fitra somewhere in your lives. Anyway, so this also, you apply this and you make fitra now, a topic of discussion in your school and you start teaching what is fitra, maybe the sixth grade level, and you start discussing with students these issues of fitra, and then you, you may want to bring in conversations as to now how society has distorted this fitra without necessarily mentioning the word distorting. You can say it in different ways, but that has to be done that your student must engage in this uh, philosophy and this reality that not everything that society does is necessarily going to be good. Not everything that you are forced to do through peer pressure is good. And not everything that the politics dictate is going to be good. And so, on. so these academic discussions need to take place and you should make the discussion of fitra and the distortion of fitra part of your curriculum and part of your your conversation with your students. It is very important, boys and girls both, they must realize this and it may be one place where we can start writing on this issue, inshallah. Okay, so this is one overarching principle uh, that needs to be taught, needs to be discussed, and you know, then, then you take it to the the Akhira, basically, right? And you say that in the Akhira, this will be manifested in whether or not you have Najat or salvation, because Islam without the discussion of Akhira is not Islam, it is secular. If you remove the Akhira, from any discussion of Islam, then that discussion becomes secular. It is limited to this world. That's what secular means. But if you insert and include the Akhirah, then that is what makes it Islamic. The inclusion of sin and reward is what makes every discussion Islamic. Right? That's the rule. This is the philosophy, or this is the principle that whatever you do. Now, 
invariably there will be subjects that are not uh, discussed in terms of ithm and thawab and you know punishment and reward in the akhirat. They're just mundane. You can disclose, the, the, disclose that and you will dis discuss those issues as mundane issues and not necessarily something that's Islamic per se. Right? Can you give examples? Anyone know? Mundane issues that you teach in school. Sports. They build character, you said. <laughs> Sports is an issue, right? That's part of the curriculum. If you get an F in sports, you fail. Isn't that so? You get you get grades for sports, right? Your participation or your lack of participation, you get a grade. And if you fail in sports, you you can probably fail. Will be on your transcript. So sports maybe is a mundane issue. We don't necessarily attach too much Islamic importance to that, and so on. So there are, there are going to be other subjects in the world history. Most of it is mundane. Most of world history is all mundane. It has to do with this world, and we really don't have a position as to whether it's sinful or whatever. Except when it comes to morality, that if you discuss the morality behind the events in history, then it may become Islamic. But history in general is a mundane subject, and likewise geography, right? Unless you uh, include the Quranic understanding of how the universe was created in uh, you know six days and uh, the earth was created in four days and the heavens were created in two days and all of that. Then you can bring that angle and what the Quran says about the earth. Those ayat are there in the Quran as a ni'mah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the, the earth a ni'mah. And how the Quran depicts the earth, the moon, the sun, the stars. All of that discussion becomes Islamic only if you include the ayat of the Quran in it. But if you don't include the ayat of the Qur'an, it remains mundane. Right? I'm not saying you shouldn't, you should. But that might be a subject in itself where you're going to have a Qur'anic studies course. Okay? So, we can talk about the Islamic studies program in any Muslim school. It must include the Qur'an. Obviously, it must include the Hadith and the Sunnah. It must include some fiqh and obviously Aqeedah. So these are your four core content, Islamic sciences, that must be taught okay, all the way from maybe grade one or three until the end of high school. Right? So there are many, I think, books out there that will help you teach these core uh, content subjects. You can pick and choose from them all. You can develop your own. Uh, textbooks and books how to teach the Qur'an. So the Qur'an as a subject, uh, perhaps with Arabic and without Arabic. So you can have a general introduction to the major themes of the Qur'an, presumably at, hopefully at sixth grade or seventh or something. Don't start too early because the, the concepts of the Qur'an are very intellectual. Okay? And the child needs to be developed intellectually uh, before the child is now thrown into those discussions. Muslim parents usually want their kids to be thrown into the discussion of the Qur'an at kindergarten. That's not what the Qur'an is about. The Qur'an is a supremely rich intellectual book of guidance and it requires a little bit of maturity and somewhat of an intellect. And the students don't develop that until much later. So you do have to be careful that it's not introduced prematurely. It must be in par, in, in, on par with some of the other complex issues that you have in social studies or in your legal theory or in your history and so on. So you gauge the level of discussion based on 
in the other sciences, you can use that as a reference, as, a, as an index, just as when you want to introduce Arabic grammar into the curriculum, then you're going to use your standard of English grammar as an index to compare. That when you introduce grammar in English, that's when you know you will be able to introduce Arabic grammar. You can't introduce Arabic grammar before you've introduced English grammar. Otherwise, how are you going to teach them? Right? So there has to be that evaluation in the mind of the teacher person. Usually, again, one of the primary mistakes all Muslim homeschoolers make and all Muslim schools make is that they first grade grammar. They don't know the meaning of the word subject, noun, verb. Give it a break. <laughs> Let them live a bit. It's okay. Throw them some words in Arabic and entertain them through pictures and drawings or something in Arabic. That's fine. Use the process of immersion in the first one or two or three grades. Just immerse them into the language without any structured grammar. Okay, you can't introduce those complex ideas before their time. So you know, that's how you can. Likewise, with the complex issues of the Quran, the Quran that speaks about pre uh, destiny and pre what's it called? What's it called? Um, it's pre destiny, right? Yeah. So the Quran speaks about fatalism. The Quran speaks about you know human will and the participation of the human being. And the Quran speaks about Allah's potency. Allah creates actions, and all of these you know very complicated, complex. Okay, ideas, they're not to be introduced before the child is mature enough to understand those concepts just because you want your child to be Muslim all of a sudden. Right? Now you can introduce points of fiqh, the do's and don'ts, that's fine. There's no harm in that. You can introduce, mashallah, many points of the seerah. But even in the seerah, you have to be careful that you don't uh, necessarily bring out ideas from the seerah too early where they don't understand politics in general and you're talking to them about why Surah Hudaybiyya occurred and it was a victory. They have to tally. So what they do in their secular studies must tally with what they do in Islamic studies. So now, if they don't have the understanding of how politics work in general, then you can't discuss the Treaty of Hudaybiyah in your seerah. You can just mention, yes, there was this treaty in which Muslims agreed to this, or the Prophet agreed to this, without discussing the fiqh of that event. So that you have to be careful. You have to be very, very careful that you don't start teaching prematurely because they will miss the boat. And that will be on you, not on them. So I usually caution people that until the 6th grade or 7th grade, and perhaps even the 8th grade, do not engage in too complex issues from the Qur'an and Sunnah and all of that. And there are people who want to introduce usul now in uh, high school, but you need Arabic before you understand usul, and before and which Arabic, the Arabic of the classical writers, not this Arabic, which is spoken Arabic. So there, you know, my, 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 my advice is that be very careful. Yeah, don't do things. Uh, there's plenty of time in high school for you to do all of these, inshallah, uh, courses and bring these discussions to the table. High school is fine. Post ninth grade, they should be mature enough to handle any discussion, any issue, hopefully. Uh, so now, so with the Quranic studies, the objective there, if it's not through Arabic, then the objective is to highlight the major themes of the Qur'an. Mm -hmm. So that you can do, uh, you may, inshallah, uh, bring about 20, 25 major themes of the Qur'an. Right? Yeah. And once you do that, then you go through those themes methodically, not necessarily in any order, but you 
bring the idea of Tawheed in there, bring the idea of Risal and Nabuwa in there, bring the idea of Akhir in there, bring the idea of the angels in there, bring the idea of destiny in there and free will, to bring the idea of Sharia in there and Taklif and human responsibility and uh, all of that, bring the idea of now, your resurrection and many other ideas that the Qur'an brings about. So there are about 25, 20, 25 major themes of the Qur'an that the, I believe the high school student must be aware of before they graduate. That's if you look without the Arabic. If you look with the Arabic, there's a different course altogether which we don't have time to, but if you need instruction on that, you may call me and you may email me, whatever, we can give you that curriculum if it's through the Arabic. But without the Arabic, the major objective, obviously you can, you, you're going to introduce them at a lower grade to the stories of the Qur'an, right? That's fine, you can do that, because there's a lot of morals in there, and a lot of zero of the Anbiya in there, that's fine. But the complex issues, the, 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 the mind that the Qur'an now builds, it's supposed to be a universal mind, it's supposed to be a thinking mind, it's supposed to be a creative mind, which respects Tawheed, Risala, Akhir. And then that's how you can develop your, your Quranic studies. The way you're going to do Hadith studies is going to be somewhat similar. Uh, that if it's without Arabic, there's one course. And uh, it's with Arabic, one course. So you, you're going to introduce to them you know, basic books of Hadith, and the history of uh, connection of Hadith, and, the documentation of hadith and you can find books on that, mashallah, people have written books on that and you can then go into the science of hadith and what are the major books on hadith that we know the Sahasita and everything else and then you may want to see how you categorize uh, the books of hadith and the works of hadith and bring out the luminaries of Muslim scholarship and how they dealt throughout their lives by writing, recording Hadith and so on. So this is how you're going to be doing Hadith studies and so on then with the Sunnah. Then along with that you're going to uh, help them understand how law is now generated from the Quran Hadith, from the Quran. So that's a course in of itself. So that that's a higher level fiqh. Lower level fiqh, obviously you do's and don'ts, you ibadat, the five pillars and all of that good stuff. Uh, you can cover by the end of middle school and hopefully but in high school you're going to be bringing in more complex sophisticated discussions on first of all the the relevance of uh, law and fiqh and then how law and fiqh is premised on the quran hadith and then the rules of uh, you know taqlid and ishtihad and all of these wonderful discussions at the high school level that must be done Okay. So you, you can develop a course just for that and see, then do a seerah of all the four imams and other uh, people of fiqh before them and after them and show them the rich uh, treasures of fiqh and how fiqh was then implemented through the courts and through the ruler and then you discuss um, the difference between what we call qada, which is judgeship and giving a verdict, verdict based on qanun and law and then fatwa which is given a verdict which is non-binding through the mufti okay. so what the courts decide in Islamic countries is qanun, it is law and what the mufti recommends is ifta and ifta usually is non-binding whereas the khada is binding and you make that distinction and you show through historical ways, how this was done in Muslim countries and how we rule and governed based on fiqh. And that's how we rule and we govern. We always had fiqh uh, as part of our communities, as part of our civilization. So these complex issues you can also take into consideration. And then obviously you have aqeedah. Aqeedah at the primary level will be through a book, al aqeedah Tahawiyah. You can introduce that book at sixth grade or seventh grade, that's easy, the translation uh, should, should be available and accessible to you, that's not too difficult. 
hopefully to teach and to articulate then more complex ideas and history of Aqidah and how the history of Kalam, how it developed and so on, that can be introduced at the later time and then you may want to get into this level of uh, Kalami issues, the Ashari, Mount Kridi, and the Mu'tazili, eventually in your junior year, or perhaps in your senior year. Then what you are going to do is, in your senior year, if you advise the student to write a thesis on something that is Islamic, then they will be able to bring all of their reading understanding of the four core content into the thesis and be able to articulate a position that they take in their thesis uh, paper. Right. I believe certain high schools do require that the senior has a thesis. I believe that's the case. But even if that's not the case, you should have it. That your senior must be able to write a thesis on something that is Islamic because you're part of a Muslim school and you're supposed to be able to articulate something that is uniquely distinctive and, uh, you know, uh, it's yours, that you're bringing this to the table, a new idea, and that obviously you need the core content, but you also need creativity, you need articulation, you need your, uh, your trivium, your logic, your grammar, and your rhetoric, uh, and that comes into action and play here, so you can do that too. Uh, as part of the, the grand finale. Yeah. Yeah. So this, in brief, is how, how, how we propose you do your Islamic studies part of the curriculum. Mm. As far as, uh, you know, engaging an Islamic philosophy into the other disciplines, okay, that's a conversation perhaps for another day, inshallah. But just very briefly, what we can say is that uh, make sure that whatever idea is presented in those disciplines uh, doesn't conflict Tawheed, doesn't conflict Risala, Nabuwa, and does not conflict the Akhirah. As long as you have those three premises covered, inshallah, it should be okay on the whole. It may or may not go against Fiqh. We really aren't too bothered about that here at this point. Eventually, we will be bothered that it must fall into one of the four madahib of fiqh, your position, and, uh, you know, we can take it from there. But initially it must be, at least it must be a aqidah friendly, right? So whatever you just discuss, especially in high school, any idea, any philosophy, any um, proposition uh, must be in line with your tawheed, must be in line with the whole scope of Nabuwa prophethood and must be in line with the primary uh, issues of the Akhirah, right? Yeah, so then you'll know that you are truly trying to infuse a Muslim philosophy into the school. So the Muslim philosophy is going to be built on these three, okay? What we call a theistic prerequisite to Islamic studies. Yeah. They're theistic because they're built on theism, especially the Tawheed and Risala part, and then it's based on theology, meaning the Akhirah is part of your theology, although it may not be theism per se. So these uh, prerequisites, before you come to the table of discussing Islam, Islamic sciences, academics, etc., you must have Tawheed, you must believe in the Risala, uh, the Khatm and Nabu of the Prophet When I say Risad, I mean this. I mean the finality of prophethood in Muhammad That's what I mean when I say Risad. Not that, not just that he was a Nabi, but he is the last Nabi. That's very important. And there are just so many repercussions if you don't believe that he's the last Nabi and some of our unfortunate practices in the community today they, they, they kind of echo this sentiment that the Prophet is not the last Nabi, although people will say that explicitly, that's how they behave. Um, and the Akhirah, obviously, the Akhirah, and that you believe in Jannah, and you believe in Jahannam, and so on. So, this will be a beginning and introduction to one Islamic uh, theory 
which helps you infuse all of this philosophy into all the subjects and brings all the all the sciences disciplines together, hopefully on one platform. Okay. So we'll stop here. No questions, comments. Yes. Uh, the idea of a senior thesis. Uh, I, I sensed from your comments about that uh, that originality is is a positive thing there. Uh, but I, I feel like there would be a certain level of tension between originality and various notions of orthodoxy. Uh, or maybe I'm being too busy to understand this. So I'm just wondering, what, you know, I, I think uh, other than making a book report more than a thesis of what other scholars have said in the past, I think most Muslims would feel very uncomfortable with a senior uh, even a graduate of a college, even at this, until someone's a PhD or Sheikh al-Islam to make any definitive, propose any definitive, or it's not definitive, but even propose an idea. Um, and so I, I, I don't know if I'm not asking a question or whether you kind of... Yeah, well, you might be, you might be surprised how creative students are. You'd be surprised. And it doesn't always necessarily have to be Islamic, Islamic, it may be mundane. But they're bringing maybe some angle of Islam into the discussion. That's all you want. You want to, you want to um, you know, encourage them to think uh, within the box. Never outside the box. At least think within the box. You, you're here in Silicon Valley, right? Yeah, so I'm sure there's so many things you can talk about in the Silicon Valley. There's no lack of ideas here. There's so many issues you can write about, talk about, think about, uh, make them, I don't know, become the next, uh, who's this guy? Musk? Is that his name? That's his name, right? Yeah. Elon Musk? Yeah. You never know. They're very creative. You'd be surprised how creative students can be if you assign them the task. I know, so you prepare them psychologically from ninth grade and tenth grade, so that they, they go into that mood and mode of, and I have to do this. But if you don't prepare them psychologically, then obviously they'll be stuck. So what, what is right, you're, you're, you're right, uh, in, in, from one point of view that, uh, you know, uh, they may be stuck, uh, so that they don't say anything against the orthodoxy. But the other, on the other front, the orthodoxy itself is so creative. Right? We are assuming that orthodoxy is equal to stagnancy. That's not the case. We were never stagnant. Even within our orthodoxy, we were very creative in our academics and rewrote books and you know titles on issues that are mind-boggling. And so it's just you know we're not there to read them anymore. Um, that uh, the orthodoxy is, is so huge. You have so much material there that you can think of within the orthodoxy. The field of psychology is wide open. The, the, the field of neuroscience is wide open. The, and the field of ethics and law is wide open. There's so much that you can discuss. But you'll be surprised. Give it a shot. shot. <laughs> yeah. Yes? Um, in terms of all these core sciences, are there any books that you can recommend for even teachers to read for themselves or for us to, to encourage our students to read? Yeah, hopefully we can give you a reading list. We can assign somebody to get that list for you. We have people at Dal who can give you the list. They're, they're very good, mashallah. Hopefully we can do that for you. Yes? Um, uh, my older two, uh, one is senior and the other one is junior, the girl and girl. Um, and I, I have to say how, say how critical this aspect of the thesis is because they're already thinking that way. They're already living their life having to interact between what they've learned about their dean and when they continue living their dean and what's, what's happening in society. So 
they're starving in our community in terms of not having opportunities to actually go through that type of process with someone they can trust, who can give them a sense of knowledge, and can bounce off ideas and help them to shape what they're thinking in a way that is positive and mm -hmm. meaningful. And it's very critical to that second, um, the twofold um, concept that you mentioned, the ability to propagate. There's no way for them to be able to go into society and propagate and produce if they're not practicing within terms of the community. So I just wanted to add, it's really critical that we have these type of spaces and abilities and opportunities for kids to do that. Sure, sure. But I will feel good, sure. No. Yes? Do you have um, examples of things students have written on that you know about or that you think would be good for students to write about as thesis? Well, I, I don't know anybody who's a senior who's been forced to write a thesis in any Muslim school. Mm -hmm. but I'm just saying in mainstream, uh, you do have schools that mandate that the student writes a thesis. I know that that does exist in mainstream, but I haven't heard of anybody in really now. If you have, then fine, I haven't heard yet. They're, they're getting there slowly, some Muslim schools. They're thinking about it. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a work in progress. First, it was the idea of lumping Muslim kids together in one school, whether you have a curriculum or not. That, that kind of, no, that's gone now. They're actually worried about the curriculum, and they're worried about the academics, and that's phase two and phase three, and they're worried about the Islamic studies. Eventually, we'll get there. So. What I meant was that, that as a teacher, what would you, if, if you were teaching seniors, um, what would be some ideas you would throw out that students could possibly write on from an Islamic perspective? Yeah, it would be according to the interest of the, the students, whatever interests they bring to the table. I mean, there are some boring ideas I would have, right? Let's talk about abortion in this country, for instance. Let's talk about the gay issues, or let's talk about the idea of, uh, you know, debt in society, meaning the financial instruments where you can be creative and remove everybody from debt or something. So, so that, well, that, because I'm more prone to think legally, I'm going to be advising that way, but a science teacher might bring something, right? And um, somebody else who is a different teacher, math teacher, may bring something else. So it's really up to the interest of the student. And I think the students are very creative if you give them the opportunity to be creative. As long as they have the core content, they should be okay with that. But to answer your question, these were, these might be some suggestions I have. Yeah. Right? Um, so as a school, we've gone through an acc accreditation process and have worked on defining our philosophy and kind of what we are and what, we're, what we represent and what we hope our graduates to possess by the time they, they leave our school. Um, at this point, we're, we're re-evaluating our Islamic program and what exactly we're teaching and trying to bind together a more cohesive program. Uh, we've kind of veered away for many years now from like the, the busy books where you're just filling in the blanks and reading certain things and have been trying to teach children from a more classical approach, um, both in Islamic subjects and secular subjects. Um, this year is the first year that we're really looking at, um, at redefining that. Where would you recommend that we start from um, in terms of if you're starting from a blank slate? Um, in that in that department, kind of recreating and establishing where I mean I know you've given a lot for us to think about right now, but um, on a, in a practical aspect, um, knowing where, where start, the state you start of from KG, where you start from? Uh, we are yeah three years old to eighth grade, fourteen. So you up to middle school. We're up to middle middle school, yeah. Oh. Yeah, yeah. If if you reevaluating, that's always good. Introspect is always good, and try and align your thoughts with what I've said today. You know, your mission statement should be in line with your your purpose of existence. Your articles of incorporation, your bylaws must reflect that, and who's ever on on the board, they must have the same idea as you do. 
The problem comes with people having different ideas on the board of education. One says this, the other says this. So you have to make sure that everybody who's part of the board or the school, the principal downwards, they all share the same philosophy. Without that one single philosophy, which I call monophilosophy, some people don't like the word, but there you go. Right? That should be across the board. They must subscribe to your philosophy as being part of the school. Now, they may disagree with it, but when they're teaching, they have to make sure they adhere to it. Yeah? So that should be there. So whatever it is you do, hopefully, Allah will give you tawfiq, just to make sure that everybody's on board and everybody's on the same page. Otherwise, it won't work. And unfortunately, for some reason, everybody seems to uh, feel they have a right to discuss Islamic studies. But, yeah. Which is quite ridiculous. So, if I go to a meeting with math teachers, I have no right to open my mouth and say, I believe this is the way you should teach. But somehow, a math teacher comes to our meetings and says, I believe we should be teaching Islam this way. SubhanAllah, MashaAllah. The problem of the Ummah. Everybody owns Islam. Right? Which is true, they own their own they own their own Islam, but they don't own academic Islam. Yeah, academic Islam is a different uh, ball game altogether. Just one other thing. Are if you do you know of programs so one of the biggest concerns uh, I'm a principal at a at an Islamic school. One of the biggest concerns that we have in, when we hire teachers who, who teach Islam uh, or Islamic subjects is that they are very knowledgeable in terms of the content and what they need to teach. Um, however, working with students and practices of childhood development and strategies, classroom strategies, working with multiple students, things like that are areas that are, that are lacking. Um, are there programs or in, in this program that we're, you're kind of facilitating where teachers also learn the art of teaching in addition to the Islamic knowledge? You'd have to put that on their development, their personal development, Man, make it mandatory for them to take courses on that. Mm -hmm. And uh, if they don't, then don't hire them, period. They have to take these courses. There's no other way to teach. If you don't know how to teach, then it doesn't matter how much knowledge you have you won't be doing your job, so I think my recommendation is that you make it mandatory as part of their, you know, you know, your HR personal development program that I want you to take these courses and then you will be able to teach, inshallah. But I don't think you should allow them to teach if they don't know classroom management, lesson planning, organization, which would be a, a rep prerequisite for your certification as a teacher, right? I mean, I think the concern is that we are not necessarily a certification program, and there there are limited resources within the community um, in terms of people who are knowledgeable and who are able to teach. Then you make so, sure that you have workshops for them, yeah. you have seminars for them, you, you facilitate that yeah. uh, for them, so that you know they're at least at the same level of uh, <coughs> methodology. You know? Yeah, but that's a common complaint that I hear everywhere, unfortunately, so there you go. Yes? Um, so also just kind of off of the Islam Studies curriculum, if you were, right now we're trying to um, come up with like five to seven topics where it can be, the same ones are re, re, not repeated, but every grade day we talk about Sira in the, in kindergarten or second grade is different than, Sira in eighth grade, or Tawheed in first grade is different than Tawheed in sixth. Can you what would be your um, advice if you were to pick up five to seven like main topics that should be that should make up an Islamic studies curriculum that can be repeated every year that are broad enough and that are important? So I think we're trying to establish programs that are scaffolded. So yeah. so in kindergarten students learn these concepts about Tawheed. And then in second grade, if it's reiterated again, they build on those concepts. Do you, would you recommend like some teaching it talk. from that perspective? Yeah. Like Tawheed was one that I remember you said must be taught. 
Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, you can go through some of the major points of Aqeedah, maybe one through ten, right? Mm -hmm. And just uh, teach them with a sense of indoctrination rather than, you know, an analytical approach, which you do in high school. You know? So those are there. You, you can sift through those uh, contents and, and the material is available for that. And, it's up to the, you know, it's, it's a, it's, it must be appropriate for the grade, that's all. So you, don't want to, you don't want to do something prematurely, so. But I've mentioned a few, uh, you know, I've mentioned Quran studies and Hadith studies, and you know, then you can throw in your, your regular du'as and memorizing the Quran and all of that. Is initially the first KG, first grade, is just keeping them busy because you're babysitting, basically babysitting. I, I don't think you should expect too much from those two grades. Your uh, education might start at second grade. Mm -hmm. It right? does, yes. So you have to be cognizant of this, otherwise, you know, you, you won't get the job done. So, yeah. yeah, our early program is very play-based. Mm -hmm. um, it's very hands-on, so. Yeah. So at second grade, I mentioned those. You can, you can talk about stories from the Quran as part of your Quranic studies. You can talk about the the seal of the process and du'as, always their basic adab of living and, uh, you know, social manners and all of that good stuff. So, like, yeah. so I guess, so, like, so he, the Qur'an, including stories, hadith, du'as, sira, and then living, like, the social Muslim life? Anything mm. else you That's right? more than enough. Okay. <laughs> what are you going to do to them? Are you going to kill them? You're going to mold them. <laughs> yes. I have a quick, very mundane question. Um, obviously, if we were starting off with a blank slate and going through creating curriculum, it's one thing. But I think a lot of schools and a lot of families are in the middle of educating the children, however they have been for so long. Um, so up until what age or at what point would you say you have room to kind of fix these errors that we've made in our own teaching? Yeah, I mean, By when should we expect certain things to be? Well, you can correct yourself until the senior year, I guess. All the way through. All the way, yeah. Something's better than nothing. Yeah. But even the senior year, you can correct yourself very quickly. Very easily. It's not that difficult. You just have to give them a different paradigm, that's all. Mm. Uh, and I have a second question to follow up on this. I've also heard the whole um, issue with should we even engage or should we even ex expose our children to things that are controversial or both Aqeedah based controversies as well as things that are just yeah, I mean, you, you, we, yeah. No, that, that's a good question yeah definitely in junior and senior year we should prepare them to to, to talk about it if not handle them mm -hmm. right otherwise we're not prepare them for life and for college basically in college, they're going to be bombarded with these uh, kind of postmodernist mm -hmm. ideas of reality and all of that nonsense. So, if you don't prepare them in junior in high school and senior, then we won't be doing our job. I don't think you should avoid controversy because it's controversial. You should have an Islamic methodology, an Islamic core content, understanding of those controversies. So, this is where your appeal comes in. And hopefully you can do that. But you mustn't shy away from controversy because then at least give them a opinion. Mm -hmm. So that when they go to college, they will say, okay, I know an Islamic opinion about this and I'm going to contrast that with this. But if you don't give them any opinion, then they will see that the default position is what the college tells them. This is a major issue. We must prepare our children for college life if we want them to go to college. If we don't want them to go to college, then there's a different issue. You have to prepare them for life in general, anyway. You had a question? Yeah, it goes back maybe related to aesthetics and even maybe piggybacks a little bit off that question about controversy. Um, what role do you feel that literature uh, plays a role 
in education. I think a lot of literature is not always the super most halal person in the world, you know, novels or stories. Um, and so probably some Muslims might have a reaction to not want to expose their children to certain kinds of literature. Um, but is, 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 should they be exposed? How, and if they're exposed, how do we uh, explain to them and then what is the value of studying something? Um, uh, you know, I mean, for example, just to throw an example out there, if someone were to be studying early Muslim or Muslim in quotation marks literature, you would be remiss not to include Omar Khayyam, for example, like especially at high school level. But you know, I mean, there's plenty of un-Islamic things in there, uh, glorifying wine and things like this. So, um, or should that be not seen as valuable literature for children or young people, adults growing up to be exposed to, and uh, you know, novels and all these classics some of which are problematic, and I understand the most vulgar and <coughs> sort of, of those probably should be shunned, but there's probably some gray area where, you know, so I... Yeah, I mean, there, 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 there are two issues. One is that as a parent, you want to insulate your child, right? As a parent. And you don't want your child exposed to any nonsense or anything that's haram. As a parent, that's fine. But as a school, that's not fine. As a school, you must open up the child's ability and potential, I would say, to the maximum. It's kind of very uh, outlandish thing to say, but there you go. I, I don't think you should be shy to expose them to any kind of novel and make reading one or two of these novels mandatory in the course that they're exposed. And because without reading those novelists, you won't understand the American culture. You won't understand the American psyche. You won't understand the American history. And all three are necessary to prepare the child for college. So trying to say, I want to, you know, I, w I want to preserve and protect uh, my child from maybe reading something in, you know, Hemingway's books. They're usually quite innocuous anyway. They're not that bad. <laughs> Hemingway's novels are okay. Yeah. But it's, it's, there's a parent who's very concerned. Well, they're, they're, they're going to be exposed to that language anyway. So let's not have it both ways. You, you can't be a hypocrite, right? They're, going to be exposed if they're not already exposed. I'm sure most kids by the age of you know, sixth grade, they know everything. If not earlier nowadays. Mm -hmm. So I don't think you should be that hypocritical in saying, I don't want my child exposed. But like you live in America, you're already exposed. Doesn't matter how you slice the cake, your child is exposed, period. Even if they don't tell you, but behind you, uh, they know everything that's going on. Right? So I, I don't think you can afford to insulate them if it's part of a school program. You may choose to insulate them as parents at home, which is fine. That's your priority, and you want to do that. But in school, you're training them to be able to go to college. And if they don't know some of the basic concepts of this culture, the psyche of this culture, and the history of this culture, they will be at a tremendous loss, tremendous disadvantage. So novel reading is part of that. Okay? So in each grade, ninth grade onwards, there should be some novels now. Obviously novelists who write, but then that's with the caveat that they understand what novel writing is about. They must understand the philosophy behind uh, the novelist. Why is the novelist writing this way? Uh, you have some wonderful books there uh, in uh, you know, American literature uh, that uh, bring about tremendous discussion of racism and inequality and you know, the system and so on. There are so many books out there. Right? The classics that you read in the, in, in the 
public schools. So I don't think you should really be that concerned. I would be concerned if you didn't have those books. Right? But, okay, what's going to happen is the parents will come knocking down onto the principal's door and say, you have this book in your curriculum, this is Islamic is haram. I don't know. That's the problem. Which is unfounded. Right? So even in Muslim literature, as you are saying, there are going to be many issues that are way, way, way more controversial than anything that these novelists have written. At a high level classical Arabic, what we do in Madaris is that we're exposed to every kind of literature and poetry. And some of it is, mashallah, very colorful, to say the least. Very colorful. Right? We study the Sada Ma'alaqat uh, of the previous Jahiliya Shu'ara and they're extremely explicit in the way they discuss uh, human beings. Right? But we're taught to study that because that gives you a background to the Shu'ara of the time of the Prophet It's a background, it's a backdrop. So I, I think you have to separate the sentiments of the parents and the philosophy of your school. If the philosophy of your school is to uh, hopefully train people to go into college and articulate a Muslim position, they will need to know something about the culture and the history. There's no two ways about it. Yes? Um, so, is, uh, could, could additionally to that, or to what extent additionally to that, is there value in and, and perhaps this could be part of the way a, a Muslim school could sort of give them a world view where they can understand that, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave human beings language, and that's one of the things that uh, human beings are distinct over other species. And even when a particular novelist chooses to use that gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, maybe to articulate, even if it's something haram, there is a beauty in that human ability to articulate that we can appreciate. Is that a valid? And so that la human language itself is beautiful and, you know, it's yeah, a language, yeah, yeah, you don't have to be vulgar, you know, to express yourself. I mean, no, sure, no, absolutely, yeah. I, I understand. But what I mean to say is that, uh, you know, even if some, some people may choose to use that gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to express something yeah. vulgar, and, you know, that in and of itself might not be beautiful, but there is other aspects of that same novel, just the beautiful way someone described a certain scene or a certain situation, and, and is there value in seeing some of that in, in the language itself, or yeah. is it really but purely there is, utilitarian? Uh, there is that, obviously, there's going to be, obviously, in every art, there's going to be a certain amount of beauty that the artist brings in, and that's why we, you know, we resort to poetry uh, for that reason, so there's definitely there what you are saying, but that should not be the reason why you you approve or disapprove. I think the reason why you approve or disapprove is for this reason, that you're preparing them for a much bigger challenge. Much bigger challenge. Yeah. Um, just a note on that. I mean, good literature is the kind of the catalyst in terms of opening up discussions that go into... Um, you know, aqida or akhlaq or development of the self or, you know, it's, it, it, the, I think it's through stories that children see themselves and so when they do read stories and you are familiar with those stories um, and it, it gives you an opening to talk about why did this character make this choice and what led them to this and, and, and what is our, our view, viewpoint on that and so, it, you know, sometimes to just give a lecture about something to a child or to just, you know, bring up a topic kind of randomly um, is a little jarring to them. But if they can associate it through this character that was positive and this character that made these mistakes or this character that kind of came out, especially from classical literature, there's so many morals and lessons and, you know, historical viewpoints, things like that that can kind of come out from it that have a positive impact, not only just in terms of language acquisition, but also just as a as a, a bit, as a way to open up discussions and and see themselves 
in these different kinds of characters. And uh, I know I, I grew up reading a lot of Persian uh, literature and being exposed to a lot of Persian and Afghani and Iranian literature. And it definitely, not everything there was a positive message, but sometimes even in those negative messages, you do see an aspect of this person made a mistake and how did they learn from that mistake and how did they grow from that? And it's kind of a, a moment to teach children and it, become, it can become a positive thing. But I definitely agree in terms of insulating them from some of the just, you know, kind of junk that's out there and, and differentiating between what is good literature and what's not. And I have found that when children are exposed to good literature early on, in terms of language and content, they have an appreciation for it at a different level. And so when they grow older, they're not really interested in that, the kind of the floof stories or, you know, Diary of a Wimpy Kid and whatnot type of stories, <laughs> which are not even classified as literature, I know, but still. <laughs> Okay, we'll stop here. You'll have all the time for coming. We'll hopefully see all of you soon. There's a problem I'm having this one.